Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's third meeting of 2018. We have apologies from Marie Goujon. Agenda item one is the decision on taking business on private on whether to take item eight, consideration of the committee's work program in private at today's meeting. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Agenda item, um, do you want to ask for declaration of interest? Uh, agenda item two is subordinate legislation and consideration of three statutory instruments. The first is regulation of investigatory powers, covert human intelligence sources, Code of Practice Scotland Order 2018 draft. Second is regulation of investigatory powers, equipment, interference, Code of Practice Scotland Order 2018 draft. And the third is regulation of investigatory powers, covert surveillance and property interference, Code of Practice Scotland Order 2018 draft. I welcome Michael Matheson, um, Secretary, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, Graham Walk, Defence, Security, Cyber Resilience Division, and Laurie Mitchell, Directorate of Legal Services, Scottish Government, who's particularly welcome as my niece. I can update you. She does very occasionally test. Never writes, never phones, but does occasionally test. Nice to see you, and Laurie. Right, um, I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk. Do you wish to make a short opening statement, Cabinet Secretary? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, there are three affirmative orders being made under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Scotland Act before the committee today. The Regulation of Investigatory Powers Covert Surveillance and Property Interference Code of Practice, Scotland Order 2018. The Regulation of Investigatory Powers Covert Human Intelligence Source Code of Practice, Scotland uh, Order 2018. And the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Equipment Interference Code of Practice, Scotland Order 2018. The purpose of the first two orders mentioned is to bring into force the revised code for covert surveillance and property interference and covert human intelligence sources and to revoke the existing codes. The third order seeks to bring into force the first code of practice for equipment interference. Equipment interference is the power to obtain a variety of electronic data from equipment including computers or computer-like devices such as tablets. This activity could previously take place under the property interference provisions of the Police Act 1997. The UK government decided to clarify provisions for equipment interference. The Investigatory Powers Act 2016 sets out a statutory framework for equipment interference for the purposes of obtaining data and prevents such authorisations being made under the 1997 Act. Those provisions required uh, and uh, those provisions uh, required uh, and were given the consent of the Scottish Parliament. With regards to the revised code, the main changes reflect the new oversight regime for all investigatory powers which come into the form of the Investigatory Powers Commissioner. The IPC is in effect an amalgamation of three former commissioners, the Chief Surveillance Commissioner, the Interception of Communications Commissioner and the Intelligence Services Commissioner. Again, consent for these provisions was granted by the Scottish Parliament. We received a small number of responses to our 12-week consultation period uh, where we have been able to. We have taken comments on board and we have made revisions to the codes. These include the addition of a new paragraph in each code to remind public authorities of their data protection duties and ensure that the safeguards, safeguard chapters in each code are consistent while acknowledging that there are differences in different regimes. What we are unable to do in the codes, as some of the responses requested, is to make provisions within them that is inconsistent with the provisions set out in the parent acts. Okay, thank you. Do members have any comments or questions for the Cabinet Secretary? No comments, no questions. Okay, agenda item three is formal consideration of the motions in relation to the affirmative instruments. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instruments and has no comment to, to make. The motions will be moved with an opportunity for a formal debate if that's necessary. The first motion is S5M-09720. Dash 
dash that the Justice Committee recommends that the regulation of investigatory powers covert human intelligence sources, Code of Practice Scotland Order 2018 draft be approved. Cabinet Secretary to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. Uh, do members have any comments? No comments. The question is therefore that S. 5M09720 in the name of Michael Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are agreed. The second motion is S5M09722 that the Justice Committee recommends that the regulation of investigatory powers equipment interference code of practice Scotland Order 2018 draft be approved. Uh, Cabinet Secretary to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. Do members have any comments or questions? In that case, the question is S5M09722 in the name of Michael Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. The third motion is S5M09725 that the Justice Committee recommends that the regulation of investigatory powers covert surveillance and property interference go to practice Scotland Order 2018 draft be approved. Cabinet Secretary to move the motion. Moved. Moved. Thank you. Do members have any questions or comments? No questions or comments. The question is that motion S5M09725 in the name of Michael Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. That concludes consideration of the affirmative instruments. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Is the committee content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final report? You are all agreed. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so it only remains for me to thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for attending. I suspend to allow the Cabinet Secretary and the officials to leave. Two negative instruments. These are Firefighters Pension Scheme Amendment and Transitional Provisions, Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 Oblique 435, and Forced Marriage, etc., Protection and Jurisdiction, Scotland Act 2011, Relevant Third Party Order 2017, SSI. 2017 oblique 461. I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk. And um, do members have any comments or questions on this? Right, no comments, no questions. Okay, agenda item. Yeah, sorry. Um, is the committee therefore agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? You all agreed? Agreed. Yeah, some volume would be good. <laughs> Make sure there's somebody out there. Okay. Agenda item five is a briefing on defamation. I refer members to paper three, which is note by the clerk, and paper four, which is um, a private meeting. Before um, I welcome our, our panellists, uh, I believe that we will now do a declaration of interest, which will cover this evidence session and the subsequent one to follow on policings. So, any declarations of interest forthcoming, Daniel? Um, I would just like to remind members that my wife is a practicing solicitor. Uh, Liam? I'll remind members that I am a member of the Law Society of England and Wales and the Law Society of Scotland and I'm a practicing solicitor. Okay. Ben? I to that I am registered on the role of Scottish solicitors. Okay. Any further? John? Uh, since you're doing them, uh, for the next item, I declare that I'm in receipt of a police pension and I'm a member of the Retired Police Officers Association. Okay, thank you. Agenda um, item five now, panel. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Lord Pentland, Chairman of the Scottish Law Commission, and Graham McGlashan. I hope I pronounced that right. McGlashan, thank you. Um, project Manager and Solicitor with the Scottish Law Reform. Um, I thank the witness for, witnesses for your written evidence. That's always very helpful for the, for the committee. And... Um, Lord Pentland, do you wish to make a, a short opening statement? It, it might be helpful, um, convener, if I, if I said just a few words. Firstly, uh, it's a pleasure to be back and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come along today and brief uh, the Justice Committee uh, on our recently published report on um, defamation. Um, Graham is the project manager. He's a solicitor, seconded from Scottish Government Legal Department, and he and I have been 
the, uh, the team uh, on this uh, project. I'm going to keep these opening remarks uh, as brief as I can uh, so that um, we have maximum possible time for questions and uh, discussions. I'm very happy to try to answer any questions which uh, members may have about uh, the law of defamation, uh, what our proposals um, entail, the kind of overarching themes which have informed our, uh, our work. We've set out the background, as you know, to the project, the case for law reform, and a summary of our main proposals in the written submission which you mentioned, convener. Um, perhaps I might just say, um, reiterate, that uh, the project was inspired by a number of responses we had to the public consultation on our ninth programme of law reform. We're just, we've just come to the end of the ninth programme. We're about to start the tenth. Um, there was quite a number of suggestions that we should examine the law of defamation from stakeholders such as the uh, professional legal bodies, the Law Society of Scotland and the Faculty of Advocates, but also from um, uh, media stakeholders such as BBC Scotland, campaign groups such as the Libel Reform Campaign. They were all supportive of a project to examine potential reforms in this area of the law. Um, one of the main reasons that respondents uh, suggested this was that major reforms, as members know, had been made to the law of defamation uh, in England and Wales by the Defamation Act of 2013. Uh, those reforms were largely, but not entirely, uh, excluded from Scots law. Um, the message we were getting from uh, stakeholders was that uh, this was an area of Scots law which was in need of review uh, to establish whether similar reforms or indeed different ones might be appropriate here. Um, as we've explained uh, in the briefing and also in the uh, report, um, much of Scots law in this area is uh, contained in rather antiquated decisions of the courts and a number of statutory provisions, not very many as it happens, scattered across the statute book, all from a time which predates the uh, modern era of mass communication and the internet. And as you will have seen, that has thrown up particular challenges for the law of defamation. In terms of our approach, um, I think most members of the committee will be aware of the way the Law Commission works in practice. Um, early on, we established an advisory group consisting of legal practitioners, academics, media representatives, um, and others to assist us in understanding how the current law works in practice and in developing and shaping our ideas for possible reform of the law. Um, it's a very important aspect of the Law Commission's work that we try to understand and take account of the law in other parts of the world, and that's something that we uh, we looked at in this project as well. Whilst our closest comparator was the reforms which I've mentioned made to the law of England and Wales in 2013, uh, there was also a recent um, body of work, a consultation paper and subsequent report on reform of the law in Northern Ireland. What we've done then is uh, to publish a discussion paper for public consultation. Uh, that was in March of 2016. And uh, more recently, uh, with the assistance of Parliamentary Council, uh, with whom we work closely, uh, prepared a working draft of a bill. That's appended to our report, and we had a second round of public consultation on the bill provisions. That round of consultation attracted a very high level of interest and response, and we had 111 responses to that. It's a significant number, actually, from members of the public. The theme which runs through our ideas and which I would suggest is really the litmus test when it comes to your assessing what you make of our proposals and how you want to go with them in due course, assuming there is a bill. The theme is to try and strike the correct balance between two values which really do pull sometimes in opposite directions. Uh, firstly, freedom of expression. Secondly, protection of reputation. We make 49 recommendations in total. 
uh, I would suggest that this report and the draft bill constitute the most um, substantial proposed reform of defamation law in Scottish legal history. They include proposals to introduce a serious harm threshold, to give greater protection to what we've described as secondary publishers, to reduce the limitation period for bringing defamation actions from three years to one, and to introduce a statutory defence of publication in the public interest. If implemented, these proposals will set out the law uh, in this area in clear and straightforward terms in a modern and accessible statute. Okay, thank you very much for that comprehensive opening statement. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Pentland, for that uh, introduction. I, I think focusing on um, the, the, the latter points you were making, um, looking at the recommendations, you, you, you talk about um, the reduction in the time period from three to one year, um, the, the serious th uh, harm threshold, uh, and also uh, the, the, the point about a single publication um, date or a single publication rule. All of those would seem to shift the balance um, from pursuer to, um, to defend it. Was that a deliberate uh, move on the part of, uh, of yourself and the advisory group? I think it's, it's important to look at the package of reforms as a whole. Um, there are a number of proposals which I think uh, might be seen as pro-claimant or pro-pursuer. Uh, for example, the proposals about um, stronger and more effective powers for the courts and uh, the idea that um, the courts would be uh, empowered to uh, order the publication of a summary of the court's judgment. So those are steps that might be seen as promoting uh, the right to obtain effective vindication where one's reputation has been damaged. Um, as I said earlier, I think what we've tried to do is to strike the right balance between these two uh, fundamental rights throughout. Um, the serious harm threshold, which you've mentioned, is a key principle uh, of this package of reforms. Um, we feel that uh, it has uh, important uh, potential effects, not least in um, uh, making it more difficult for powerful interests to use defamation law as a tactic or a weapon to try to silence unwelcome criticism. So I, I, I'm not sure I would agree that these proposals, including the ones you've mentioned, uh, are necessarily pro either side. The whole idea is to try and get this balance correct. But no doubt when parliamentarians come in due course to assess these, uh, these ideas, um, you'll want to consider whether you are satisfied that these proposals do get the balance right. Sorry, a rather long answer, but no. one of the challenges of describing this body of work is that the... Uh, at one level, it's all quite technical. But no, that, I mean, that, is, that is helpful. I mean, it, it strikes me that the, the intent in some respects appears to be reduce the overall um, quantum of, of cases or the circumstances in which cases get brought forward, but to a greater degree of certainty uh, around what happens uh, when cases uh, are, are brought forward um, legitimately. Is that, is that a fair? That is true. I mean, one of the messages we got from uh, a range of publishers, including uh, people working in the new media, is that um, having to deal with a threat of defamation proceedings can be uh, a very difficult and intimidating challenge for such persons. And um, uh, it can be used, as I say, as a tactic or a weapon to try to stifle debate and to stifle the free flow of information. We're, we're keen on giving the courts effective tools to um, sift out unmeritorious claims at the earliest possible stage. That's something that 
the courts don't really have the power to do at present. We'd like to move in that direction. This has, done, this has been done quite successfully in England and Wales under the uh, 2013 Act, and we've tried to learn some lessons from that. I mean, notwithstanding the, the, the reassurance you give about, uh, about the balance you've sought to strike there, either within the advisory group or, or through the process of consultation, um, are, are you confident that you've been able to, to take the views of those who represent pursuers on a, on a more routine basis? Absolutely. We, we, we had a number of uh, um, submissions from uh, those who habitually act for claimants. Um, we we uh, involved them in the advisory group. They attended some seminars which we uh, arranged. So yes, I'm, I'm confident myself that we've taken account of those views. We haven't always agreed with those representations, um, but that's our job. We have to come down and make an assessment at the end of the day of where we think the, uh, the right direction for the law to go is. Those areas of, of, of disagreement, as you say, it may, be, it may be impossible to satisfy the, the, the demands of, of everybody in such a process, but, but where would be the, the concerns of those who, who, who represent pursuers in, in relation to the balance you sought to strike? I think there's, there's two that spring to mind. One is the suggestion um, that the serious harm threshold will constitute an additional barrier and make it more difficult for people to bring defamation claims. Um, that hasn't been the experience in England and Wales. I don't think it could be said that um, any serious claim has not been allowed to, per to be pursued. The, um, the English courts have been very keen to uh, emphasize that uh, a pragmatic approach should be taken towards this new test and that it shouldn't be allowed to um, uh, develop into uh, elaborate, uh, expensive procedure at an early stage in an action. Usually it ought to be quite simple and straightforward for a court to assess, uh, just by looking at the statement which is complained of, whether or not it's likely to have caused serious harm. Um, so I, I wasn't myself and the team wasn't persuaded that that representation was, at the end of the day, uh, sound. I think at the level of principle, we find it difficult to see why it would be right for a claim to be allowed to be pursued where serious harm to reputation had not been caused. Okay. I know other colleagues want to touch on that, so I'll leave, leave Steve, my question. Thank you. Uh, Daniel. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, convener. Uh, on that very point, I mean, obviously, the, the, the introduction of the threshold of serious harm is one of the, the, the key proposals. Um, I was just wondering if you could bring that to life for us, uh, or obviously, because that, 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 that's a, 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 a phrase that's open to interpretation and potentially subjective. So I was just wondering if, A, you could uh, describe what is meant and also describe uh, how you would propose to actually codify that within, within proposed legislation. Yeah, well, the... the um I suppose each case will depend on its own particular facts, and the court will have to decide on the basis of the looking at the statement first, whether it's likely to have caused serious harm to the claimant's reputation. For example, an allegation of serious crime of the, or an allegation uh, of uh, uh, child sexual abuse or paedophilia or something of that nature. I don't think any court would have difficulty in uh, quickly coming to the view that that has is likely to have caused and will continue to cause serious harm. Um, off the top of my head, uh, some uh, minor allegation about um, misconduct uh, of a, a small scale nature in a private relationship, that might not be thought to give rise to serious harm. For clarification's sake, I mean, from, from, from what you just said there, it sounds as though when you're talking about serious harm, you're talking about serious harm with regard to an individual's uh, interactions with, 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 with other people, whether that's, uh, uh, you know, from, from a kind of a, a working standpoint or indeed an interpersonal. Uh, it, would that be correct? And, and then my, my supplementary to that would be, to what, to what extent could serious harm be in terms of one's sort of personal 
uh, demeanor, well-being, um, or, or indeed uh, mental health, which obviously wouldn't have any impact with interactions or not directly. I and mean, would that be taken into account? I think, I think the key... Uh the key thing to bear in mind, perhaps, is that defamation law is concerned with uh, the protection of reputation and with providing redress for unjustified damage to reputation. Um, so that's what the courts will look at. Does the allegation which is complained of, the statement which is the subject of the proceedings, does that look like a statement which is uh, likely to cause serious harm to the reputation of the person complained of? Uh, of the person doing the complaining. Uh, an another factor that could, uh, um, that, that could come into this would be where um, very little damage to reputation can be shown to have been caused in the particular jurisdiction where the proceedings are brought. This takes us into the realm of so-called libel tourism, which was one of the factors giving rise to the 2013 Act south of the border where proceedings were being brought by wealthy and powerful interests in the courts of England and Wales on the back of minimal publication, perhaps a relatively low number of um, downloads in that jurisdiction. The courts were in the process of developing in England and Wales a, a common law abuse of process jurisdiction. This is before the statutory reform to try and give greater scope for weeding out such claims at an early stage. And to some extent, the statutory reform in the 2013 Act and what we are now proposing builds upon that. I don't think it is at all likely that the courts will strike out anything which looks like a serious, um, well-founded, arguable claim. Can, can I finally just ask about the, 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 the time limitations that you're, you're proposing? Um, I mean, it strikes me in this, this age that the, the, the date of publication can sometimes be in, in uh, doubt. Uh, we have extensive republication going on in a number of ways, whether that's uh, essentially people republishing things by copying and pasting or indeed retweeting. Um, could, you, could you just explain how that, that one year cutoff will, will be interpreted and how big a shift is that? My understanding was that, that, that it was from the, 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 the current situation is, is that it, the, the time starts from when you first are, become aware of, of um, a statement being made. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could just clarify the, 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 the impact, well, to what extent we are moving away from that and, and to what extent you looked at, 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 at you know, republication and so on. And proposing now is that um the clock should start to tick when a person first publishes a statement to the public or to a section of the public. And so far as um, republication is concerned, we heard a lot of representations from uh, consultees to the effect that um, this, uh, th that Whatever the limitation period is, it should not be allowed to restart. The clock should not be reset, in other words, each time there is a further publication, often by way of a fresh download, perhaps many years into the future. And this is quite a clear example, if I could just make this point. This is quite a clear example of um, defamation law um, having to rely on concepts which were developed perhaps over a hundred years ago when publication meant something far more serious, far more substantial and far more difficult to achieve than it does now. And it's really for this reason I think that the project came to us in the first place and that we decided to take it up because what we're interested in at the Commission is areas of the law perhaps not of great political sensitivity, but areas of the law where, for whatever reason, society has moved ahead of the law and the law needs to catch up. Yes, the, the, the issue that that throws up is if something is published in a relatively obscure place on the internet, an untrafficked uh, website 
or you know, some other obscure thing that essentially is not being observed, and then is republished many years later on something that yeah. has huge uh, uh, traffic, um, would that subsequent publication therefore not constitute defamation? And, 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 and in that situation, is that not potentially quite unfair on the individual where they might, you know, quite reasonably have had yes. no reason to have been aware of the, the initial publication at all? No, I think, if I may say so, that's, that's a, 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 a extremely valid point. Um, there could be minimal publication and then many years later, mass publication, say, on a celebrity's Twitter feed or something of that nature. What, how that would be addressed is by application to the court's discretionary power to override the time limit where the circumstances of the particular case justify that being done. That's the case um, across the board in limitation. Uh, the uh, courts retain a, a discretionary um, jurisdiction to disapply the strict application of uh, a limitation period where the particular circumstances of the case justify that in order for justice to be done. So something published um, you know, to the public um, on a uh, remote, obscure website years later republished, say, by a national newspaper. I think that could be quite a strong set of circumstances for the one-year limit to be disapplied. But all depends on the circumstances of the individual case, of course. Yeah. Ben, you had a follow-up? Uh, thank you, Convener. Good, good morning. I just wanted to, in a, in a similar vein that Daniel Johnson asked for uh, elaboration on the, the, the definition of serious harm, uh, on the, on the other side of the argument, the introduction of a statutory defence of publication on a matter of public interest, how would, uh, what would you be, could you elaborate on your proposals for the, the te At, that test? Yes. Um, what, what we're doing there is putting onto the face of the statute book um, a common law principle which has been developed by the courts over the past 20 years or so, uh, essentially for the purpose of um, protecting Res responsible journalism in the public interest, even where it might not be possible for the um, uh, statement to be defended on the grounds of truth. This was developed by um, the courts in the leading case of uh, Reynolds against Times newspaper. Times newspapers, um, it's become known as the Reynolds defense uh, Albert Reynolds, the former Taoiseach of the uh, Irish Republic, uh, brought defamation proceedings against uh, the Sunday Times, which went to the House of Lords, and the case ultimately failed. The House of Lords developed this doctrine, which has been recognised in most jurisdictions across the world now, to protect uh, responsible journalism, particularly investigative journalism, where it can be shown that the uh, publishers have acted responsibly, have uh, conducted uh, an open-minded and fair investigation, have given the uh, subject of the report the opportunity to answer it, even though it might not be possible for whatever reason for the publishers to prove the truth of the allegations by evidence. Nonetheless, the defense of um, uh, uh, publication in the public interest can apply. This is seen by uh, the media uh, as uh, particularly important. It's not a defence which has been explicitly recognised in any case in the Scottish courts as yet, although the understanding in practice amongst those who work in this field is that it does apply. And what we're doing is putting that question beyond doubt or proposing that it should be put beyond doubt by introducing this provision. I hope that explains it to... Yeah, thank, thank you yeah. for that. Thank you. Yes, that was certainly a, a, of interest. Perhaps no one's um, willing to dip their toe in the water just yet, but if we had statutory provision, it would be absolutely clear that there was a, a public interest defence. So I think there's an issue there that yeah. I know is of concern for investigative journalists. Um, Beanard, while, yeah. while you raise that point, and, and in case I forget to mention it, 
that um, I think um, when it comes to an area of the law like this, which is important not just to lawyers and to newspapers, but actually to the general public, there is quite a lot to be said for putting the key principles into modern language in an accessible statute. I'm not suggesting that everybody is going to rush off and start reading the Def Defamation and Malicious Publications Scotland Act once it is, um, once it, if it is enacted. But um, we did hear, for example, from the um, uh, representatives of the new media that they would very much like the ability to be able to go quickly to the statute law database when they receive this letter of complaint written, as they always are, in extremely strong terms by claimants' lawyers and rather intimidating terms, and actually just find out quickly what the law is in a provision which everybody can understand. Okay. Um, moving on now to definition, and, and certainly you, you said that what attracted the, the Law Commission to it was that social media, other ways of communication had moved on quite substantially and perhaps definition hadn't, defamation hadn't moved with it. Now, the, the, um, the bill doesn't actually um, cover those who provide equipment. It's the takedown, notice and takedown procedure, which the Defamation Act in 2013 does make provision for, where um, if, if a, a complaint is received about a post, a website operator must identify the person making the post, and if it's not possible for the complainer to do so themselves, um, uh, to, to remove it. Now that's in the USA, but the, the bill takes a different, um, a different course of action. Can you explain what and why that action has been yeah. taken? This is, this is a very, very difficult area. And um, what we have discovered is that pretty much every legal system across the world has been wrestling with how to deal with this question of secondary publication or publication by internet intermediaries. People who are on one view simply providing a platform or a means of access to information which is already in the public domain. Ideally, these issues should be addressed, I would suggest, on a supranational level, as they to some extent are by existing European Union rules, although those have been the subject of quite a bit of criticism. At least they should be addressed on a UK-wide basis, we think, Obviously, the internet doesn't recognize national borders and information flows freely from one jurisdiction to another. What we have um, proposed is essentially uh, an interim solution pending what we hope would be that type of wider review. Trying to cut through this and recognizing a distinction between those who are essentially originators of information on the one hand and those who are not on the other. So that in principle, those who fall into the latter category, whom we describe as secondary publishers, would not be liable in defamation for republication. However, what we learned is that what most complainers want is to have um, offensive material quickly removed from the web. And we are proposing that the focus should be on that, thereby, therefore, confer on the courts stronger, more effective powers to order takedown or removal at an early stage of proceedings where appropriate. That, in the proverbial nutshell, is where we are coming from on this. The difficulty with that is it, it involves court procedure having to go to court, whereas the take-down notice and take-down procedure, as, um, as it, it's um, outlined in the De Defamation Art 2013, requires them just to do it, not to have to go to court, with all the expense that that may um, involve, uh, and delay too. That, that, is, that is true. Uh, we looked closely at the model um, provided for in the 2013 Act, which you've described, uh, Convener, and we took quite a bit of evidence from uh, uh, 
uh, persons in England and Wales who have uh, experience of it. The rather strong message we got was that system hasn't worked. It's uh, too elaborate, it's too bureaucratic, and it's largely ignored by the internet companies. Um, they don't like being put into the position of being a censor, and they say that that has a chilling effect on freedom of expression because an intermediary, someone who has not originated the statement, will very often not be in a position to defend or justify the accuracy of the statement because they will not have access to the um, information on which it was based. So we're trying to find a way to uh, cut through these problems and that's the scheme that we've come up with. Yes, it may involve ultimately court proceedings in some cases. However, where, um, where it, when it becomes known that the courts have these uh, more effective powers which can be exercised right at the start of an action, then that itself may have an influence over how um, publishers react in practice to complaints. You've mentioned that um, perhaps it's not just Scotland-wide, um, the rest of the UK should, should look at the, the same kind of law, but more importantly still, it should be on a supranational uh, basis, and that's certainly something that resonates with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, where this has been talked about, and the feeling has been expressed if there were more um, politicians and um, legislators looking at this, having the same solution, then that would um, probably balance the, the kind of influence that um, internet providers seem to have just now to be able to, as you said, just ignore this. A, a couple of thoughts briefly on that, if I may. Um, it would be good if Scotland could take the lead and uh, our proposals have already attracted, quite, on this area particularly, have attracted quite a lot of interest. Um, different solutions have been devised in different jurisdictions. Um, I think there's quite a lot to be said for ours because of its simplicity and straightforwardness, and we're relying on established concepts of authorship, editing, etc. Uh, so, uh, I, I think, yes, the international dimension is important, but I don't necessarily feel that that should hold this parliament back from uh, itself trying to devise an appropriate solution which will work in this jurisdiction, even if it is seen as an interim solution and one which will be built on in the future. Um, so that's my thinking on the international dimension. Yeah, that's very helpful. Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, can I ask you about um, the bill prohibits uh, public authorities from, from suing, um, such as universities or, or housing associations. Would this not adversely affect them in protecting their reputation? And what was your thinking behind, behind that? Um, th th this, this is a proposal which we uh, developed um, following uh, the initial consultation exercise. It was represented to us by some stakeholders um, for example, the libel reform campaign, that we should do this, and uh, we've decided to go with it. Uh, essentially, we're putting onto the statute book the existing law. So public authorities at present, under what is known as the Derbyshire principle, after the case in which the uh, principle was developed by the House of Lords, public authorities under the present law are not entitled to sue for defamation. Essentially, the justification is that it should be for public authorities to defend their reputation through political means or in the uh, public sphere rather than by through the courts. Has the Derbyshire law been upheld so far? I yes, mean, that's, yes. That's, th there's been no that, that's, deviation no, from that. That, that that's, that's well settled. Right. That's okay. well said. So this is just putting it into the legal framework that that's... Yes. Yeah. Again, uh, the message we were getting uh, was transparency, clarity, accessibility of the uh, legal rules. Thank you. 
can understand the, the rationale behind public authorities. I, I suppose universities would argue that they themselves are uh, uh, autonomous entities of, of uh, government. There's been uh, quite a, a lively debate in this place yes. over recent years around that. I, and reputational damage for them would, I think, uh, be seen as a serious risk, particularly um, at universities competing in an international marketplace for, for, for students and indeed for, for staff. So I, I just wonder, following up Rona's question, whether or not there's a distinction to be made uh, between universities on the one hand and, and public authorities in a more traditional sense on the other. The question of whether a particular organisation is a public authority um, is not a straightforward question. Essentially, it involves consideration of whether the body's um, functions include functions of a public nature. I'd have to give some thought to the position about um, whether university constitutes a public authority for the purposes of this provision. Um, I can't remember if we looked at that. We must have looked at that specifically at some stage, Graham. I mean, one of the one of the sort of let outs is for for charities you know, where, where, where um, non natural persons or charities are, have purposes consisting of only one or more charitable purposes. So that's one of the the let outs that we've we've, um, yeah. we've written into the the bill. Um, yeah, as Lord Pelton says, the, the the balance between whether a, a, a body is a public body in terms of this definition is a a tricky one, and it's certainly one, you know, it's maybe not by, by no means perfect what we've come up with. We can certainly open to ideas as to how to draw that line. It was quite a, a hard line to draw, I think, in it terms is, of... It is. We got quite a lot of feedback on this at the stage of the bill consultation, as I recall it. Um, essentially, what we've done is uh, take the definition of a public authority from the human rights case law and the human rights legislation. Um, I'm not sure I'd like to express a view now conclusively about the position of universities. Perhaps I could think about that. That'd be helpful. And Thank you. we're happy to come back to you on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just one final um, question, Lord Pentland. You've said in your opening statement, and again, your written statement, that um, the bill, the draft bill, and the report constitutes the most uh, substantial proposed reform of defamation in Scottish legal history. Now, you will be aware that the role of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has been extended, so they could possibly look at bills. So I suppose the question is, given that it raises public interest and all of um, the, the areas you've covered in, um, in, in terms of investigative journalism and, and, and also the internet, do you think it would be a, a more appropriate with the Delegated Powers or the Justice Committee to look at? I'm not sure it's necessarily for me as the Chairman of the Law Commission to express a view <laughs> about um, parliamentary procedure. Um, that's a matter, I suppose, for the Parliament and for the Parliamentary Bureau. Uh, yes, it we, is most certainly. It will we, be the we, uh, uh, we, we've, we've had a number of measures recently with the DPLR committee and they have been successful. My recollection is that the criteria for admission of bills to that, um, to that procedure are quite narrow. There's been some discussion as to whether they should be widened, but they do include amongst them uh, the, the, the um, bureau being satisfied that there's a wide degree of consensus amongst key stakeholders uh, about the need for reform and the approach recommended. Um, now, there's some flexibility inherent in that, obviously, but it, I mean, it may be that this particular piece of legislation, in view of the interest which it has generated, uh, the strong views of stakeholders, it may be that it would be thought perhaps more suitable for the Justice Committee. But as I say, it's not really for me to say. We're happy to support the bill wherever, wherever it goes. It goes yeah. I think there's other things about referring direct to criminal law, significant financial implications. One that's a bit dodgy, the, do they have significant European Convention human rights implications? Yes, that's, which is, that's a good point. The human rights point. aspect as well. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, as I say, um, wherever it ends up, and I very much hope it does end up in some committee, <laughs> 
uh, we will be uh, more than happy to uh, continue to support it. Can I thank you very much. That concludes our evidence session. Uh, this is obviously a very important bill. Can I thank the Law Commission for their work and for our appearing before the committee today. I now suspend um, to allow a change of witnesses and a brief com comfort break.
Agenda item six is an evidence session on policing in Scotland. I refer members to papers five, which are a note by the clerk, and paper six, which is a private paper. We now move to the evidence session on policing Scotland, and we'll be hearing from both Ian Livingstone and Susan Deacon on a range of policing matters. Um, as everyone knows, there are ongoing live investigations being conducted by the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner concerning the Chief Constable and others which are proceeding under statutory process. I therefore remind members uh, to be careful to avoid exploring issues which could impinge on these investigations. And I welcome Deputy Chief Constable Designate Ian Livingstone, QPM, Police Scotland and Professor Susan Deacon, CBE, Chair of the Scottish Police um, Authority. And I thank both witnesses for your written submissions, which are always very helpful to the committee. Now, I understand um, that um, Susan Deacon, this is your first appearance, obviously, before the committee, and um, you wish to make an opening statement, but that, Mr Livingstone, you're quite content just to move to questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, as members are aware, I took over as SPA chair last month. Um, so I very much welcome this early opportunity to engage with the Justice Committee. Um, the SPA is one of our nation's most important public bodies and it has oversight of one of our nation's most important public services. So I regard it as a real privilege to have taken on this show. The SPA has... Um, made significant progress in some areas over recent years, not least in developing Policing 2026, a 10 year strategy for policing in Scotland developed jointly with Police Scotland. However, it's also the case that the SPA has been criticized over many aspects of its leadership, its governance um, and its practices by this parliament, by government, by Audit Scotland and by HMICS and others. I share the concerns that have been raised and I've made very clear since coming into this post that I'm determined to do the, all that I can to drive forward improvements in the way that the SP operates so that the public, the parliament, the police service and others can have full confidence in the work that we do. I think the role of the body as the key body that oversees and scrutinises um, Police Scotland is of fundamental importance. Um, I also believe that the job of work that needs to be done in developing policing in Scotland over the years ahead is significant. I think we have an excellent police service, one that we can be proud of, but like every police service in every part of the world, it needs to adapt to changes in demands and expectations. So the SPA has to be fit for purpose in my view if it's to play its part in driving forward that process of improvement and change in the future. I've set out a number of early guiding principles that are in the written submission convener that I have been adopting in my early weeks as chair and I'm seeking now to embed in the way that we work as an organisation. This includes increased transparency and clarity around government, governance, more robust decision making, um, a stronger public service ethos, better trust in relationships and engagement, and yes, a process of continuous improvement going forward. I've made some early changes that I hope um, members will agree are steps in the right direction, but there's a job of work to be done. So I will be continuing to work hard with members of the board, with colleagues in Police Scotland to ensure that we continue to drive forward improvement in the period to come. Um, one of the relationships that I hope that, that we can build and develop further is a relationship with this parliament and with its committees. Um, and I hope that in the months and years to come, there will be various opportunities to engage at different levels with MSPs, with this committee and, and others, um, because I think our relationship with this parliament is very important. So thank you again for the invitation to be here today and I look forward to the discussion. 
Thank you very much for the opening statement. Could I perhaps ask, and this would be directed to both of you, you you've um, acknowledged that there, there could be improvements and both Police Scotland and the SP have recognised that there were initial difficulties with regard to particular roles and responsibilities set out, as set out in the 2012 Act. So can I ask both witnesses if they are confident that the 2012 Act is still fit for purpose or could it be amended to provide greater clarity, understanding of the roles and responsibilities of each um, organisation or in some other way? I go first. Um, I think that fundamentally the legislation is right. I mean, I watched like everyone else from the outside in in some of the early debates that took place um, regarding what the respective roles and responsibilities of the SPA and Police Scotland should be. I think many of those matters were resolved um, and have begun to bed in, although, and we may come back to this, I think, and I'm sure DCC Livingston would agree, that there's still much work to be done to ensure that we get the right role and re relationship in place between the SPA and Police Scotland so that we deliver that effective scrutiny function that I referred to earlier. Um, as, as far as structure is concerned, again, watching from the outside in a few years back, um, but with, as someone with significant interest in public services in, in Scotland. Um, I actually believe that the creation of Police Scotland was an important and significant step forward. Um, actually, since coming into this role, to be honest, I've become ever more convinced that we have fundamentally a structure in place that is good for Scotland and good for policing in Scotland, both in terms of ensuring that we have the best possible specialist operations, but also that we can flex that national capability into delivering effective local policing across the country. Um, is there still work to be done? Absolutely. There's been a big process of integration and reform going on, um, taking eight legacy forces into to one um, single service. That's still very much work in progress. And again, I'm sure DCC Livingston would have more to, more to say on that. But fundamentally, yes, I do think that the overarching legislative framework and structures are right. I think we all need to work together to make sure that we work as effectively as possible in the public interest going forward. DCC Livingston? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think, I think the act is, is, is there, and I think it's clear that um, from my perspective, the delivery of policing and all the elements of that, whether that's the people, the money, the ICT responsibility, to, to be effectively delivered have to be under the, the direction and, and control of, of the Chief Constable. Um, therefore, the role of the authority is, is as a governance function of scrutiny and, and accountability. I think in the early days, there was a little bit of confusion that the authority would somehow be involved in, in, in service delivery. I think with hindsight, as, as I look back, it was perhaps because it was seen as the successor to the SPSA, um, which was an entirely different, different animal. That was about, about shared services and the delivery of shared services. So as some of the elements of the SPSA came over to the SPA, I think it took a bit of time to properly understand that the SPA was there as, as, a, as a governance uh, board uh, and the service delivery um, other, with the exception of forensic services, should rest um, with, with Police Scotland. Um, so my view, having, having read that act um, more often than I, I, would, I would have wished it over the last number of years at different, at different times, I think the structure of the act is right. I think our challenge and our duty and responsibility is now to, 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 to allow the intent of Parliament and the intent of the act to, to, to take shape. Uh, and we need to be very clear um, between the authority and ourselves, how, how, that, how that will be going forward. I already feel a different atmosphere uh, with the, the new chair and the, and the new operating officer. The level of engagement, the level of communication, um, the level of openness is, is, is very, very different um, from how things have been in recent months and years. So I think that approach to our work uh, is just as vital, if not more so, than the actual words of the, the legislation. Uh, Daniel Johnson. Thank you, convener. Uh, yes, Good morning, Moy Ali, former SPA board member, appeared on Good Morning Scotland on, on uh, Radio Scotland. And she said of the SPA board, and I'm quoting here, that it has a long history of poor decision making and went on to say that it, it, uh, there was a failure of genuine independence and an unwilling for board members to challenge each other. I was just wondering if Professor Deacon would recognise those characterisations and, and, and what, what do you feel needs to be done 
to put those things right if you do recognise those, those uh, characterisations? Well, obviously, um, my primary focus is on looking to the future. I said on, well, when my appointment was announced that um, I want to learn lessons from the past, but very much apply those to how we develop in the future. Um, and I believe it is absolutely fundamental that the SP board works effectively as a board in the space that it needs to be in. And if I can just elaborate on what I mean by that. Um, as, as I indicated, I think the SP board and its members have done a lot of good work and worked very hard, but I don't think, and I've heard this expressed in this parliament on many occasions, I don't think it has fully moved in to the role as being that national oversight body that is very open and outward looking and within that has decision making processes that really stand up to scrutiny and that all can have trust and confidence in. Um, so I have looked very carefully at work such as, for example, HMI, the HMICS report last year that looked at matters of openness and transparency. Um, I've already made some changes to the way that the, some early changes to the way that the, the board meets. It previously had a practice, and again this has been discussed in Parliament, had a practice of having public meetings, closed meetings, members meetings, <coughs> committees, working groups, and various variations within that um, in terms of when there weren't, were and weren't, for example, officers present and so on. Um, and not always, in my view, as effectively um, supported and recorded as, as the decision-making process should be. So we now have in place a single board meeting and within that, at the end of the agenda, we will take items in private, just as is normal practice in any public body, in local authorities, in this parliament, in the NHS, and so on. And where we do take matters in private will be for good reason, and members appreciate there are many good reasons why certain business has to be conducted in private. There will be occasions where members meet um, less formally, but rather than these being or being seen to be meetings, um, what um, I have already started to develop, um, and we had a session with Police Scotland just um, two weeks ago, last week, <laughs> recently, um, in exactly this space. You know, I've made these less formal meetings more about being workshops and strategy sessions, and the next one's going to be around board development to ensure that board members, you know, are absolutely fully versed in all their roles and responsibilities as part of the pub uh, that public body. Um, there is a lot more work to be done. Um, <laughs> there are, I think, 10 different... Um, framework documents of various types under the heading of governance on the SPA website with varying degrees of, of um, well, some are more up to date than others, um, but there's certainly a real clutter there. Um, and again, a piece of work that I've initiated and with support of HMICS, who, as I say, have already looked at this, these matters in some detail, is that we really start to reshape some of those governance frameworks. Because I won't people, whether it's MSPs or the public or anyone else with, else with an interest, to be able to look into the SPA and see clearly how it functions, how it operates, and be able to engage in um, our decision-making processes and understand them as far as possible. So, yes, I do recognise um, a number of the criticisms that have been made, but as I say, my focus is to try and learn from them and change things in the future. Thank you. I think that's helpful. And if I can just refer to your uh, written statement, and, and indeed I think you repeated this in, in, in your opening statement, you described the, the work you need to do is around simplification, transparency and clarity, a strong, developing a strong public service ethos, and building public trust. If you don't mind me saying, those sound like rather fundamental points uh, for, for a body such as the SPA. So, uh, given that you described that there's a job of work to be done, could you maybe outline what you think the nature of that work is? I mean, it sounds to me, if, given that these things are so fundamental in nature, that you really require to do quite a, a fundamental review. These things aren't things that can be addressed piecemeal. So if there is a requirement for you, what form should that take? And, and what sort of timelines do you, do you expect uh, to conduct it uh, to? I couldn't agree more. I think these principles are absolutely fundamental and that's why I'm crystal clear that I want to make sure that the SPA is 
living up to the standards that should be expected of an important public body as soon as possible. On timescales, um, where I can make changes quickly, I'm endeavouring to do so. And we also have a new interim chief officer in place that began just a couple of weeks before me. So he's also been looking at the executive functions within the organisation to make sure that they work effectively as well. Um, there is a job of work to be done, and you know, I, I you know, say openly to members that I think that it will take many months for the SPA to really be operating in the way both in systems, culture, practice, governance structures, and so on, that I think, I think it needs to do. Um, there is a particular, there are particular um, issues regarding how the board itself functions. Um, the cabinet secretary has actually just written to, to me this week seeking my assurance that I will use the performance review process that I'm obliged to carry out anyway as chair to ensure that Board objectives are clearly stated, not least to achieve some of the, the, the principles that you've outlined, um, and the individual board members and their objectives are aligned with the direction of travel that I've outlined. Um, I'm pleased also that the Cabinet Secretary has indicated his willingness um, to work in partnership with the SPA to ensure that we do make progress in the areas that, that we've touched on um, as quickly as possible. You are absolutely right. There's, these things are fundamental. And to be honest, um, the more that I've, I've looked at the SPA over the months leading up to my appointment, because I looked at a lot from the outside in during the selection process itself, and having looked at the organization from the, the inside over, over the last number of weeks, then, you know, I, I too, <laughs> I'm asking the question as to why some of these fundamentals have not been better developed. But as I say, you know, what I need to do now is make sure that they are and that that's done at pace. And I'll happily keep reporting back to this committee or to the Parliament more generally about what we're doing in that regard. I'm just wondering whether or not specifically there needs to be a, a, a single review, piece of review work done and a single sort of published review, just because I think they are so fundamental and they are so comprehensive in terms of their nature that actually it needs to be looked at in the round and, and addressed in the round and addressed publicly if we're going to really instill the, 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 the sense of public trust that I think you rightly allude to uh, in your written statement and your opening statement. I smiled there when you mentioned the word review because I'm, I'm tempted to say that I have rarely seen an organisation that has been subject to so many different reviews um, and I think that is a range of work, including deliberation of, of several parliamentary committees, the work of HMICS, Audit Scotland as well, and the observations it has made in successive Section 22 reports, that actually gives us a very good basis upon which to act. So no, I don't think there needs to be one single process of review. I think what there does need to be is a process of sustained and accelerated continuous improvement that puts into practice um, the kind of standards that, that, that I've talked about today and also have been identified in these various reports. So actually we have a very good, I think, evidence base to build on um, from the scrutiny of the SPA that's already taken place. We need to drive change forward. Can I just ask one final question to DCC Livingston? Uh, since you assumed your role as Acting Chief Constable, could you tell me how many times you met, have met with the Cabinet Secretary and uh, if you are aware if all of those meetings were minuted? I couldn't tell you, uh, sitting here, how many times I, I've met with him. I meet with the Cabinet Secretary in, in, at different locations. We often speak at um, events or, or, or conferences or award ceremonies, bra bravery awards, uh, e etc. Um, and I have uh, a series of, of regular meetings uh, as diaried in, in the, the Chief Constable's uh, diary. So, in general terms, I'll have seen Mr Matheson oh, I would say easily a dozen, a dozen times and spoke to him uh, more frequently uh, by, by telephone. Um, and I don't personally uh, take a minute of those meetings. They're, they're much more informal 
um, and almost a, a, a reflection on uh, where, where policing is and, and uh, at times out where I was in terms of any, any support or further resilience that was required to, to sustain Police Scotland through, through the current situation. You're not aware of any minutes being taken? I'm not aware, no. Um, could the same question perhaps be put to um, Susan Deacon? I've had several um, meetings, again, you know, some pre-arranged, but some just in the course of events and so, and, and so on. I mean, Scotland is a small place and, you know, we all interact in lots of different ways and forums. So I've had several meetings with the Cabinet Secretary and with um, a number of Scottish Government officials. Um, more, I think, than I would expect to be having um, when we get into a better shape, I think, as an organisation. Um, I'm very comfortable with um, the communications that I've been having. And I think, for the record, and, and convener, you know, I said this also when I met with you and the clerk, and I've, uh, I've said this to, to other MSPs, um, and I said it during my interview process for this post um, as well. I believe it's really important to have an open flow of dialogue and communication. I think that's, that's right and proper. Um, I think there are occasions, and these are a matter of judgment for all those involved, there are occasions where discussions should be you know, treated more formally and re recorded more formally. And I think moving to another place, which is around decision making, I think that's one of the areas that really needs improved within the S SPA. Um, but the idea that there should be regular flow of communications um, to my mind, is just eminently important if we're going to work effectively. And I think that that doesn't in any sense detract from my ability as SPA chair to assert the appropriate boundaries um, for the organisation between us, government or others. In fact, I think when you've got good open dialogue and communication, it's actually easier and, um, to enforce these boundaries and manage them effectively with appropriate openness and trust and respect. I think sometimes it's important to put things in context as to question. I'm going to ask um, DCC Livingston directly in, in terms of the uh, former chair of the SPA and the SPA's decision that um, the chief constable should return to, to work. Was there any conversation or was there a meeting with the cabinet secretary and yourself? And was there any record of this meeting? Was any official present? Is there anything that um, can be looked at to see what took place? Did anything take place? Was there any conversation? No, I, I, I had no conversations with the cabinet secretary. Um, regarding the, um, the fallout, if you like, from the, the meeting of the, the 7th of November. Um, I did have communication with the then chair of the police authority. Um, I, on the evening of, of Tuesday the 7th, asked Andrew Flanagan for an update on the, on the police authority's uh, meeting, because I knew they had been meeting. And I felt it was important that I got that update, um, because I had responsibility to the the men and women, the officers and staff within, within Police Scotland, should there be a, a change in, in Phil's um, circumstances and in, in, in the Chief Constable's circumstances. I didn't get a reply to that. I did get a reply on the Wednesday um, when I was told that deliberations uh, were, were ongoing. Um, so I left the matter at that. I was surprised that, that I hadn't had a briefing or had an involvement from the Police Authority, um, but I didn't have any discussion at all with the Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you. George Adam, on this point, supplementary. Very quick one. Uh, DCC Livingston, uh, obviously the much publicised uh, ongoing, uh, that meeting of 7th of November where the decision was made. Uh, did, when that decision was made, were you informed at any point of about any kind of welfare programmes being put into place for your officers or people who had made complaints? Was there anything that was actually explained to you that this would be taken into account? No, 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 there wasn't, and, and that, that was the reason I had asked the, the then chair um, for, for a readout, because my, my responsibility is, is, is to ensure that everybody's interests are maintained, where they work, the proximity of where they work, and the circumstances of it. And whatever that decision was, um, we would have implemented it, and we would have taken steps to, to make sure it was implemented um, as smoothly as, as, as possible. Um, but, it, but because I was not party to, to that uh, decision, by the authority because my advice or, or, or views um, were never sought and, and because I was never asked to make any uh, welfare provision, none, none was made. Um, and then I was told on the afternoon of Friday of that week 
um, that uh, the board had, had decided to continue uh, Phil Gormley's leave, and, and that was the update that I received from the then, the then chair. Um, but there were no welfare um, or well-being uh, steps put in place because I was never told that they, they were necessary. This would be a classic example of uh, the, what Professor Deakins already said of the correct relationship between SP and Police Scotland and what you said yourself as well about communication. You know, it sounds very basic, but in this scenario, it would be something that would have made all the difference uh, in moving forward. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. Uh, and, and, and openness about um, what the, the, the decision was, and then a realisation that um, you would have to take certain steps if you were going to change the current operating environment uh, within, the, within Police Scotland. And we would be able to do that. We don't, you don't need you know, weeks on, on end to, for any change to, to arise, but you certainly need more than a, a few hours mm -hmm. um, so that people who have made uh, complaints, people who have an expectation that their rights and interests will be protected, people who have a, a, an expectation that they and their families' rights and interests will be protected, are, are steps are, are, are taken so we can tell them and then we can make arrangements for their, their, their working circumstances, just as we would... If, if Phil were to return, we would, there would have to be that discussion and, and there would be accommodation around, around um, Phil Gormley's uh, working circumstances as well. But none of that took place at the time um, because I, I was never told that that decision had actually been taken. Okay, thank you. If I could just perhaps follow up on that point, um, Chief Constable, um, I, I, I noticed that on the interview that you gave to the Holyrood magazine, you've again stated there that you weren't personally aware of the Chief Constable uh, was going to resume his duties. Can you say categorically that no one in Police Scotland was aware of this? No, no, one, to, no one to my knowledge, uh, convener, um, but given that I am in, in, in the Chief Constable's absence, I am in the role of and, and having to discharge the responsibilities and duties and the accountability uh, of the office, um, I would be very surprised if anyone else in the organisation had been, uh, and I'd, I would actually be extremely, extremely annoyed and disappointed if anybody else in the organisation had that awareness and I didn't, given the responsibilities and accountability that, that I was carrying and, and continue to carry. But you can't rule out the possibility that they may have. I can't, I can't be categorical around that because I don't know what everybody else knows, but I, I would be extremely surprised and I would feel it would be a, a real uh, breach of uh, protocol and, and, and extremely, uh, extremely discourteous to, to me given the, the position I'm, I'm currently in. Uh -huh. Can I also just ask one more question before we move on to supplementaries? And that was still on this interview where you, you, you said that you were mentioned in the press release that was put out. I think you've challenged the, the content of the press release, uh, saying that you hadn't seen it. But is it not the case that the press release uh, was merely thanking you for um, stepping into to your duties, I think, um, acknowledge DCZ designate Ian Livingston for the reassurance, stability and direction he has given to officer staff partners in the Chief Constable's absence. So mentioning you in that way, there would be no reason to inform you in advance. It was very complimentary. No, I, was, I, I, I wouldn't have expected. Uh, my, my point was that I hadn't seen this draft press release and yet I was mentioned in it. And it's often the case, and members here will be aware that if, if, if you are mentioned in a draft, and there seem to be a number of people who were involved in preparing the draft, if you're, in a, if you're mentioned in a draft, it's often, it's not uncommon that, that you're given a copy of that draft. And I, I was just clarifying, because I was asked a direct question as I'm being asked here, I was just clarifying that I hadn't seen the draft press release, notwithstanding that I was mentioned. But you're, you're absolutely right, it, 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 was, it, was, a, um, it was a nice uh, remark that, that included me. John Finney. Yeah, I was going to pick up on the points that uh, um, Mr Adam picked up on because I think staff welfare is very important. Can I ask you about operational implications, uh, DCC's Limist, and that is uh, the rank structure, the way the police operates, there'd be significant implications where you unaware of something had that information been passed. And could you explain some of the implications that there could be, perhaps for ongoing operations? Well, well as in the... The role of Chief Constable, there are certain operations under, under statute that, that, that only I or any individual in that role can, can authorise. Uh, and, and the structure of responsibility that sits um, as, as, as recut uh, in, in Phil's absence was that, that DCC Rose Fitzpatrick would then discharge the discipline 
function and the conduct duties, again, under, under a statutory, statutory code. So the roles and responsibilities within the senior team um, cannot, you, you can't move them around casually, that, that they are a matter of, of, of law. Um, we, I often write in a formal sense um, in terms of, to, to, to Rose and to other colleagues in terms of what their duties and functions are. Um, I'm, I'm obliged um, to authorise um, from quite very sensitive covert activities um, that would be in my name. Now, all of, all of these matters can be accommodated. Um, and you, you know, if, if there are change to circumstances, as there was in the past, we will, we will adjust and we will go forward. And if there's a, another change, we can make those adjustments again. But it, it does need time and it does need the involvement of, of senior police officers, including myself, to, to give effect to any change. And presumably re require clarity not only within the organisation, but with liaison with other agencies that you would have to... In, in, entirely, enti entirely correct. I, again, um, in, in the absence of the Chief Constable, uh, I formally uh, received intimation from the Lord Advocate um, that the Lord Advocate and, and the Solicitor General and the Crown Agent um, would see me as vesting in the accountability and responsibilities of the Chief Constable. So should the Lord Advocate or people acting on his behalf see fit to, to issue a direction, as, as in law, uh, the Lord Advocate can, that direction would, would come to me, and that he, uh, Mr Wolfe, would be holding me uh, to account to discharge uh, the, chief, the Chief Constable's responsibilities. So there, the, these are not matters that can be, you can't snap your fingers. Um, they can be changed and they can be adjusted and, 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 and they will be and, and, and they have been done in the past. Um, but there are, there are constitutional issues, as, as you allude to, um, that would need some consideration. Um, and none of that was done uh, in, in early November. Okay, a, a very brief question, if I may, then, and that is about the, the separation of these functions that you've highlighted, the disciplinary. Do, do you feel there's adequate resilience at chief officer um, level in Scotland at the moment as a result of uh, some absences? I, I think at this stage there is. I think uh, the, the authority um, supported um, my proposal for an additional two assistant chief constables. Um, we've introduced two assistant chief constables, both qualified individuals. One has specifically got a portfolio around about professionalism and assurance, and that's looking to ensure the, the, the standards, not only of, of officer and staff conduct, but the standards around about our, our, our information uh, handling and, and our information retention and storage and, and the, the, the assurance work that's required within, within the organisation. And then an additional uh, Chief Officer, Assistant Chief Constable going in to, to support the crime work. Uh, the crime work. In terms of the senior team, I think that additional work, Assistant Chief Constable has supported it, um, but it, it, it is not, it, it's not overly fat, the Chief Officer team. When I um, became an Assistant Chief Constable in Lothian and Borders Police in Edinburgh in 2009, the then ACPO Scotland had, had over 30 members, um, and, and I was one, eight chiefs, eight deputies, a whole series of chief officers doing uh, functions, and they were all committed and they were all busy. You know, we've now got to the stage where um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm currently operating with 12 uh, chief officers, um, and clearly that's a, that's a significant reduction. So those chief officers are busy, but clearly the work gets also gets pushed down to the superintending ranks and down into uh, the, the federated ranks as, as well. So I think we've got enough, but I do think your observation around resilience is, is one that I keep my eye on and would come back to the chair of the authority if I felt we needed to, to build that resilience further. You'll forgive me if I saw that as being one of the benefits of a single service, <laughs> losing a lot of these chief officer posts, but I'm reassured that you feel it's resilient at the moment. Yeah, I do. Thank, Thank you. you. I bring Liam McCarter on for the avoidance of doubt. If I could just take you back to the, the press release and the dispute about the necessary steps with Police Scotland having been taken to ensure suitable arrangements are in place to support the welfare of all involved parties um, uh, until the alleged conduct issues are concluded. You've, you've said quite categorically that, that you certainly weren't involved in that. Can you say equally categorically that no one in Police Scotland had any discussions about this issue? I can say categorically that no one to my knowledge had any discussions and I, I would reiterate what I said earlier that I would be extremely surprised and extremely disappointed if there had been such discussions without my knowledge given the, the position I was and am in. 
but you couldn't rule out the possibility that there may have been discussions with someone that you didn't know about? I, no, I, I, I can't, no. Thank you. Uh, Liam McArthur. Just follow, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning. Just following on that line of questioning, I always struck me DCC Livingston is a, a very calm individual, um, but it, 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 it didn't escape, I think, anybody's notice um, the, the, the sense of, of let's say, disappointment bordering on, on anger at, at what happened um, on the 7th, 8th of, of November. Although you left it at that following your, your conversation with, with Andrew Flanagan, um, can you... Uh, give an assurance to the, the committee that uh, nobody either on your instruction or, or, or independently then had conversations with um, uh, with the Justice Secretary's officials around concerns you might have had uh, about what you'd heard from Andrew Flanagan on the 7th of no, November. No, what, what, I, what I heard from Andrew Flanagan was that no decision had been taken, or that, that I was told on the 8th, I heard nothing from Andrew Flanagan on the 7th, and on the morning of the 8th, in response to my request for an update, I, I was told um, that deliberations were ongoing. Now, it would appear that that wasn't the case, that there had to have been a decision taken on the 7th. But I was told that deliberations were ongoing and, and he would, I would be briefed in due course. At stage you left it that, there was, there was well, no... Well, I, I, I responded no. to that and said I, was, I, I said thank you, but I said I was very surprised that, I, that given my role that I wasn't involved in any of the discussion. But I, I left it at that. And then the next I heard from Andrew Flanagan was a text message on the Friday of that week and then I called him back when I was told that the, the authority had taken the decision to extend uh, the Chief's Constable's uh, leave. But I wasn't told, actually, there had been a decision, a reconsideration, and then, and then another decision. Uh, I did have a conversation. I was phoned on the Thursday evening um, by Paul Johnston, um, uh, the civil servant that, within, with the head of justice, and told that uh, there had been a meeting involving the Cabinet Secretary and uh, the then Chair, um, and that the then Chair had put it to, to uh, the Cabinet Secretary that the Chief Constable was, was to return to work at 8 o'clock the next morning. And Paul, Paul checked with me, he said, were you aware of that? And I, again, confirmed to him I had, I had no knowledge of that. Thank you. Just going back to the, the line of questioning that Daniel Johnson um, was, was probing with uh, you, Professor Deakin, around um, <clears throat> governance issues. Uh, obviously, you've, I, I welcome a number of the assurances you made about um, your intentions in the role and where you see the SPA going. And I think at various stages, you've, you've I think, laid deliberate and heavy emphasis on um, the opportunity you've had to look at this from the outside in. Now, to some extent, you could argue that Andrew Flanagan was in the same position in, in 2015 when he came into the, the, the organisation um, and undertook that last review. Do you not though perhaps see concerns that, um, uh, that an internal review by the SPA of, of, of governance isn't necessarily going to challenge the, the, the structures and the working practices, etc., uh, within the SPA and between the SPA and the other um, main actors in the way that um, something independent of the SPA is likely to do. And I, and I, and I recognise that there are other uh, bodies, including this committee, who will provide a challenge function for, for, from outside, but, but nothing necessarily uh, in, by way of a, a strategic, across-the-board, independent assessment of, 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 uh, of governance with recommendations about how that can be improved. Well, let me be clear that, as Chair, um, I'm determined to look very thoroughly and, as you say, strategically and comprehensively at these issues. And one of the early steps I've taken in conjunction with the Interim Chief Officer um, is for us to bring in additional support to enable us to do that. Now, as I said earlier, I'm more than happy to give us a few months, I think, to, to keep working on this, but more than happy to report back to this or other parliamentary committees as we continue to make changes in the future. With regard to external review, I have to stress again that there is a considerable accumulation of external review and observation and criticism of, of the SPA, but it hasn't been translated into practice um, in terms of the improvements that need to be made. And as I say, I particularly reference the HMICS report from um, July, uh, yes, June, sorry, last year. Um, so I want to act on all of that. So I think that's the right thing to do, 
to drive forward change. Um, I have quite a strong view that I've expressed in many roles over the years that it's very important not to get stuck in a process of continuous and perpetual review, that actually what you need to do is, is drive improvement and change. Um, and if I may, actually, one of the areas where um, I have done that as a matter of some urgency, not least based on my own observations around the kind of decision-making processes that have been followed, for example, at the meeting on the 7th of November, is that I move very, very quickly to change and strengthen the way that we deal with complaints and conduct issues, which is fundamental. My predecessor had, as chair um, had adopted a, a, a practice whereby decisions were dealt with either at full board level or through delegated authority to the chief executive. Um, and he had removed decision-making powers from committees and in turn um, removed the previous complaints and conduct committee that was in place to deal with these matters. Now, it, as, as many members will be aware, it's very important that you have a proper body that can, you know, that can consider these matters, that it's a smaller group of members where you build expertise around the decision-making, where you put proper advice and support into the room where you have proper papers, where you consider options, um, and where you have, um, for example, appropriate handling strategies going forward for how you're going to take forward decisions and so on, is precisely because, you know, I observed very early that these were the kinds of processes that weren't in place that I took early steps to reinstate that Complaints and Conduct Committee. We approved that at the board meeting held in December in public forum, and that committee is now meeting, and that's the way in which these matters will be considered in future. And I think that's a case in point where you can't wait for another review. We're dealing with some really important live sensitive issues, and I want to make sure that whatever process is in place in my watch is robust and stands up to scrutiny. Um, so, in a case like that, making early changes was, was absolutely critical, and I think the new Scottish Government and others could rightly look to me as chair and say, you know, what are you doing now to make the organisation more, more robust, um, rather than wait for, for further review and analysis to be carried out. But I do stress, we are working, um, particularly myself and the Chief Officer, and as I say, with support from others, including HMICS, to look pretty comprehensively at the organisation, not just in a piecemeal way. You referred there, and, and I think in your briefing, to the, um, uh, to the additional capacity or the, sorry, the additional skills you were looking to bring into the, into the board. Um, can you maybe explain what those specific skills are um, and whether this is indeed additional capacity over and above um, the, the, the board membership that is in, in place at the moment? Or is this going to be a, a bit of a, a mix of bringing in new board members while, while uh, dispensing with existing ones? Well, the legislation provides that the authority um, can have up to a maximum of 15 members. Um, under the previous chair, um, three positions had by choice remained unfilled. Um, in the recent period, two other members have stood down, so factually we have five vacancies. So one of the things that um, I've accelerated and worked closely with Scottish Government Public Appointments and the Commissioner's Office to make sure that we do this as quickly as possible, but absolutely in accordance with the relevant codes and, and so on that would be expected of, of, of a robust public appointments process. We've gone out um, to uh, the, well, the, the, the appointments process is live now, um, and that's on the public appointments website of Scottish Government and on the SPA website. Um, if people are interested to look at that. Um, and the applications close on the 31st of January. So that provides us with another early opportunity to strengthen the board. With regard to the kind of skills and capabilities that we're bringing in, um, unashamedly, we have uh, said, and we actually run an initial um, sort of trail around these appointments before Christmas, um, where we said quite clearly that we want to reach out for some of Scotland's most able and committed people to join this board. It is, as I said earlier, one of Scotland's most important public bodies. We're looking for people who might come from a range of backgrounds, but all of whom um, will have a, a passion for policing and public service and will bring to the table um, the capabilities and the experience and the resilience, frankly, to operate effectively at that strategic, non-executive board level in a front-facing, publicly accountable organisation.
I mean, in a sense, what you've described, one would assume, um, are a skill set um, that is contained within the current board. I and mean, what additional um, skills do you think um, are not currently reflected or reflected um, adequately enough uh, within the board that you, you are trying to get at through these additional appointments? I don't want to, to bore members with, with too, too much detail in the appointments process, but I'm happy to share, share more at any stage. But as a matter of fact, under the previous chair, um, the skills matrix that was developed for the board placed particular emphasis on bringing in a range of technical skills and, and specialist skills into the board. And many of those skills are very important, and the individuals who have come on to, to the board have applied those skills in a range of, of different ways. But what I've identified is that we need to bolster the board in terms of its capacity and its capability to function at that, that broader strategic level. And within you know, a very publicly accountable environment, um, that's, that's the landscape in which we reside. And I'm hoping that you know, some of the new members that join us you know, will have really good experience of operating in that environment and therefore will help to also drive the kinds of change that we've been talking about today. As I mentioned earlier, in addition to that, it's also my responsibility to carry out a performance review process of existing board members and it's through that process of setting objectives and aligning that with the direction of travel I've outlined that, that you also continue to, to drive that change. And I should say as well, just as a matter of fact, as is the nature of any public body. Obviously, different board members have different tenures of office, so over the months and years ahead, just through the natural process of things, there will be further change within the board. So again, with any process of, of um, open public appointments, it's incumbent on me and, and others involved in that process to look at what we identify the needs of the board to be at that moment in time and make sure we're bringing in appropriate capability. But I stress that's all being done through very open process and absolutely in accordance with the codes laid down by the Commission and others. Would, would you see it, so just finally, would you see it as important that the, the board has a, has a geographic reach as well as a skill set reach, given that um, we're talking about a national force and a national board? Yeah, I've done an awful lot of work over the years in, in the whole sphere of um, governance in different sectors and different organisations and I believe really passionately in the need for a balanced board um, and you achieve balance in a range of different ways. I mean obviously you know we have a lot of discussions around equality and diversity and um, gender balance and the like and that's something that I, I want to address. The board could be better balanced in that respect. Geographical spread I think is important too. On a board of 15 people, you're never going to get absolutely, you know, every part of the country or every perspective or interest around that table. So what's important that as a board is that it, it knows how to engage widely and effectively and address all these different ranges of interests that people have in different parts of the country and in, in um, different communities. Um, but the other thing about having a balanced board um, critically, and this actually relates to some of the points that Daniel Johnson raised earlier as well, is you need what's sometimes called cognitive diversity as well, and that's about you know, people being willing to think differently from one another and to challenge each other um, in, in that discussion. So I, I think the other thing that really needs fostered within the SPA board is more of a culture where there will be that constructive challenge um, because I think that's vital for any board in any organisation if it's to function effectively. Chair Ben McPherson, then Liam Kerr, and then Rona. Thank, thank you, convener. G good morning. Um, DCC in Livingston mentioned the meeting on the 7th of November, and uh, as a result, I wanted to, uh, in the interest of parity, ask, ask this question to, your, to yourself, Professor Deacon. Um, mindful of the PERC investigations uh, ongoing under statutory process, as the convener mentioned, as the new chair, I just wanted to give you the opportunity, uh, if and to the extent you feel appropriate, given those, those considerations. Uh, did you have any comment you wish to make on the decision-making process uh, on the 7th of November last year? Well, obviously, it predates me. Um, I... Um, I'm aware, obviously, of it, and 
my initial insight and understanding to that meeting and indeed previous decision making in a range of different areas actually came directly from my, my predecessor as chair in the handover briefing that he gave to me the week before I started um, in post. And it's precisely because of some of the concerns that I had about the way that that and other meetings were being handled that literally on my first day, which where I had an informal meeting with board members, I indicated that particularly in relation to complaints and conduct issues, we simply would not, under my watch, be, be handling these matters in the same way in future. And I've already outlined the changes that I've made in relation to putting in place a, a committee to deal with that and appropriate process around it. Um, I really do believe it is fundamental um, in any organisation, but particularly in a public body, that you have really robust and effective decision making and that you have proper recording, that you have proper handling strategies, that you have proper expert advice. Um, and not only does that enable your decisions to stand up to scrutiny, it means that when put into practice, they're likely to be more effective. Um, and it also means, actually, if you have good process, you're more likely to have good outcome in terms of, of the decisions that you reach. So, yes, I've, I've, looked, um, I've looked quite carefully at that, that particular meeting that has become the matter of considerable um, public attention. Um, and, you know, I, I found it wanting in many, many ways in terms of its process. Um, and I will just add, since this has also been a matter of some considerable debate, um, that, you know, had I been in the Cabinet Secretary's shoes, and I have walked in these types of shoes in the past, um, then I would have asked questions about the process as to how that decision had been made. And personally, I think the Cabinet Secretary would have been failing in his duty had he not asked those, que those questions. I will also say for the record that if at any stage in my tenure as Chair of the SPA, the processes um, that I um, follow require to be questioned in that way by a Cabinet Secretary, then I would regard that I would have failed in my duty as Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Um, just following on from Liam MacArthur's line of questioning, Professor Deacon, if I may, are you, you, you were asked in some depth about the board. Uh, so, are you recruiting, are you specifically recruiting a specialist railway experience for that board as HMICS recommended? No, we haven't specified um, any area of, of specialist background of that nature and that's after considerable consideration about what the board needs at this moment in time. It's perfectly possible that we may receive applications from someone with that background um, and you know, through the proper appointments process it may come to pass that that, that that background is represented on the board. But I want to make a really important point, I think, about a board. And it's actually one of the ways in which I think the board, the SPA board hasn't been developed effectively in the past. That the role of a board is to make sure that the right expertise um, is available for taking decisions. You don't put all of that expertise in place through your board appointments alone. And the role of a board member is to make sure that when reaching decisions, they reach out for the appropriate advice, guidance and, and other expert input to take their decisions. And in my view, um, that's one of the areas where the SPA board hasn't operated effectively enough. So in the area that, that you mentioned, for example, there are different ways to bring in expert knowledge and advice. And my expectation would be, and I'd say to anybody scrutinising us going forward, you know, that, that I, would, I would expect you to, 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 to ask me, you know, in what ways did you ensure that you had the right, right advice, the right evidence, the right data, and the right expert knowledge as part of that decision-making process? Some of that might come from your board members, but it can come from external advice as well. Perhaps I could put that question to you then. Uh, if, if you're not recruiting a railway specialist to the board, how will you, the... SPA ensure, given the current context of what's going on with the BTP, that that expertise is actually there? Well, I think I've already answered quite fully the different ways that you ensure that you have the right expertise around decision making. And of course, um, the integration of BTP is, is one of a number of significant areas of development in policing going forward and one of a number of significant areas of development for the board more generally. 
Um, again, DCC Livingston can say more about the integration process because that's a matter that's been led by Police Scotland. But as far as the SPA is concerned, the, um, the SPA already has a working group looking at BTP integration. Um, there has been a lot of work done, even just in the time since, since I came in, um, to really ensure that the SPA is cited on the work that Police Scotland is leading on the integration process and that we are putting together a clear understanding of what that integration process will look like and the costs that are likely to accrue from it. Um, myself and DCC Livingston actually have a meeting with the Chief Constable of BTP and the Chair of BTPA respectively um, coming up in just a couple of weeks' time. So I assure you that you know, this is a matter that's being looked at carefully, but I stress also, as I said already, it is one of a number of significant areas of change and development within policing. And my commitment is to ensure that we develop and strengthen the, the role of the SPA in its oversight and understanding and scrutiny and monitoring of these elements, of these developments, that we report effectively both through our board and where necessary to Parliament and others on how these, these processes um, are moving forward and that at all times we make sure that we do that in a way that is as, is, as open as, as possible um, to build public confidence and trust. But as I say, P Police Scotland are, are leading on this area of work, so if it's something that the, the committee wants to consider further, I would defer to DCC Livingston to speak in more detail about it. Um, any supplementary? Are you quite content with that, uh, Fulton? Yes, just as a quick supplementary convener, I would ask, and it might be for DCC Livingston, then, um, if, we're still, if he believes we're still on track uh, to complete the integration by April 19. I, I think we are. Um, the, the chair uh, of the authority said that we are now leading in terms of the, the, the policing element of that. that. That is a relatively recent change. The authority actually um, sat on the, the UKY programme board um, we then have assumed responsibility uh, really since, since uh, last autumn and in the course of that time we have identified uh, there are significant issues regarding ICT issues, regarding uh, terms and conditions, regarding pre-existing third party contracts that, that um, will not, in my judgement and, and in our team's judgement, be resolved by the, the 1st of April 19. But what we are determined to resolve by the 1st of April 19 is to make sure that the operational uh, direction and control vests in the Chief Consul of Police Scotland on that date, and then we continue post 1st April 19 to resolve uh, those, those other matters. So we've identified uh, those matters. Uh, we're working very, very closely, um, as Professor Deacon mentioned, with both the Transport Police Authority and British Transport Police themselves. Um, we will continue with a significant amount of energy that we've got, um, but we're determined to give effect to the, 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 the legislation on the, the 1st of April 19. So just as a very brief supplementary to that then, Convener, as well, based on what you've said there, you don't think there's a need to pause the current plans for integration? At, at, at this stage, I think we will have uh, an, an effective integration in, in place by, by the 1st of April 19. But if matters arise and they are causing difficulty, we, we, we won't uh, be masking it or in any way saying that th things are fine um, when they're not. Um, I will be uh, letting the authority know that and will be letting uh, the very legitimate interests of, of people around this table know it as well in, in terms of the, the public debate. Okay, thank you. And Maurice Corley, following on from the line of questioning. <coughs> thank you, Gavina. Um, this is Ian Livingston. Um, good morning to you and to Professor Deacon. Um, there have been significant concerns about following on from Liam, my colleagues, Liam Kerr's uh, comment about the BTP officers and the changes and everything else. Uh, and can, can I say, uh, there's been some concerns about uh, regarding the employment status of the BTP officers and their terms and conditions and the sort of two-ping across uh, once they transfer into Police Scotland. Um, can, can you give me some, some idea of where we are on that? Because I know there's significant, and I'm talking about talking to Bobbies on the beat in my own area, uh, who are really quite concerned. Can you give me any comfort of? I, 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 what I can do is I can say I share your, your, your concern. Um, I think what's clear and what has become clear is that this is not a, a, a merger of, of like with like. Uh, the merger that brought Police Scotland into being 
um, were in essence eight entities of, of the same nature and, and the same status. So the Office of Constable and the workings and practices in terms and conditions. Um, BTP are, are, are different, as, as exactly as, as you've alluded to. Um, we need to make sure that we can protect their status and their entitlements as, as, as they come forward, but at the same time, give them the flexibility to move fully into the into the, the, the full body of, of, of Police Scotland. Um, so I think that I can't give you comfort that we've resolved the issue, but I can, I can give you an assurance that we're working extremely hard and that we do recognise um, the, the, the challenges that, that come around that, that difference in status from a, a BTP officer compared to a, a police officer um, within Scotland. And what are those challenges you refer to? The challenges are round about, round about pensions, round, round about certain in, in, entitlements. Regarding status, um, you know, the, the, they have em, em, employee status as opposed to the Office of Constable that vests in, in officers in, in, in Scotland. Um, and therefore, to bring that element of the organisation into policing needs um, some, some legal work, some needs work around about HR, and needs to get the, the support and involvement of, of everybody in, in, involved. Um, but I think you're, you're, it's entirely right and legitimate that, that you, you, you highlight it as a, as a significant issue that needs resolved, and, and that's one of the key elements that needs resolved between now and, and uh, April 19. Do you feel, one final question for you, do you feel amongst your ranks... Um, that there's a feeling, a perception that um, there's a difference in the status of members of the Peace Scotland and members of the BTP as this amalgamation comes forward? I, I don't think so. I mean, o over the years, the... the yeah, but I'm talking about the other ranks. It's not, been brought, it's not been brought to my attention that, that, that there's an there's a inherent tension at, at constable or sergeant or, 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 or inspector level. Um, depending on the individuals that you speak to, the, the, the 220 odd uh, British Transport Police officers, it, like, like lots of things in life, it often depends on where they are in terms of their, the, their, their length of service or whether they see greater opportunity that Police Scotland may bring or whether a, a number of them actually, well, I, I joined Transport Policing and I want to stay there. What we've said, that nobody, absolutely nobody will be moved away from Transport Policing against, against, against their will. We will, we will honour that and we, we will protect that. Um, the operational relationships over the years are extremely strong with British Transport Police and, and, and both the legacy forces and now um, Police Scotland. Uh, so on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's Hibernian at Hearts Hibs at, uh, on, on, on Sunday there, whether it's the international events at Murrayfield, all the movements, all the events, all the incidents, all the movements that, that go, the, 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 the rail network within Scotland as a whole, there's a very close operational relationship, and, and, and that's something that I, I want to build upon. Um, but if there are any tensions, I, I, will, I will look to resolve them and work with my colleague uh, and uh, the Chief Consul of British Transport Police to, to, do, to do that. I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you, Convener. Supplementary, British Transport Police. Uh, care. TC Livingston, if I may. The, um, you talked about an integration, uh, but you said uh, the terms and conditions, the third-party contracts, and the ICT will not be resolved by the 1st of April 2019. That, to me, is not an integration uh, if, if these matters are outstanding. So uh, can I ask, if they won't be ready by the 1st of April 2019, when can we expect terms and conditions, third-party contracts and ICT to be integrated? I, 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 can't, I can't answer that specifically. I think, I, I'm, I, and again, the, the management of this piece of work it does not... We are involved in it, Police Scotland, but it sits as a, as a joint board with the, the Department for Transport and the Scottish Government. That, that's the overarching uh, structure to, to give effect to, to, to this change. Um, we, as, as the police service in, of, of Scotland, will clearly be working very, very hard to make, to make sure we're in a position to, to receive uh, the officers and staff and to receive uh, the statutory responsibility that, that the Act has, has, has mandated. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm being absolutely clear that, that actually those issues have such a level of complexity that they won't be resolved by the 1st of April 19. And what we're working to do is to make sure that we can give operational effect to the intent behind the legislation and then deal with these other matters um, in, in, a, in a considered uh, and an, appro an appropriate manner. But if I'm a BTP officer transferring across, I know that on the date that I become part of Police Scotland, my pension might not be resolved, my terms and conditions might not be resolved, 
Uh, is that really the assurance that we can give to the, the BTP? Well, it's not, it's, not, it's not me personally that gives that assurance. I've said to you before, it's the, the, it, this, is, this is a government-led program. That Professor sits, Deacon said you were leading that sits, DCT. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the police res response in, in Scotland, um, but the, the, the issues around these matters, such as the pension provision, I've, I've said uh, to Mr Corey, I absolutely recognise that. That is, is core to an individual police officer, whether BTP or, 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 or Police Scotland. Um, I'm committed to doing everything I can within Police Scotland to resolve it. I don't think everything is within my gift to do so. Um, and and I, I don't disagree that these, these, are, these are significant challenges. What we're trying to do is, is trying to make sure that we can give effect to the parliamentary intent and that the Chief Constable of Police Scotland will take operational direction and control, but that there are a number of issues that will, will require, um, as we have identified them and called them out, and, I, and I'm being very clear uh, this morning, um, that they, they will require to be resolved at some time after the 1st of April 19. And doesn't it concern you then that the transferring BTP officers look at that situation, listen to that response and say, you know what, I want no part of this, and they retire? It, 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 it does concern me. As I've, as I've said previously, I know, I know British Transport uh, Police officers, I know how committed they are. Um, they're very, very close colleagues. They train with us at Tully Allen when they go through their training. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a closeness there that, that's already. So if they have concerns, um, I want to do everything I can to try and allay them. And then we'll get to Rona. <laughs> Entry on, on one of the points there, and it is for you, uh, um, Mr. Livingston, and it's about the ICT. Um, the uh, I6 contract was scrutinised in this building. We know where it is. We know that the, the challenges there are with the integration in Scotland. Um, there was a lot of discussion when we were scrutinising the legislation about the I6, uh, about the, the integration in the different uh, systems. You talk about the collaborative working that goes on at the moment. Are there issues around? Um, ICT that we don't know about or that haven't been discussed in the process of that? Because clearly, uh, information technology is a huge part of modern policing. Uh, you know, we know, we know the, the, the lack of compatibility between some of the legacy forces. Yes. We know, likewise, UK. Is there something we don't know about? No, I, I, I think that's, a, again, you've, you've, you've expanded upon the, the, the challenges that are there. We, we don't have a, a single operating base um, for our different systems uh, within, within Police Scotland. Um, we are certainly, in terms of our, of our uh, command and control and, and our uh, area control rooms, the significant progress we've made after some undoubted errors were made. We've learned from them. We've, we're now moving on. You will know from the discussions we've had in, in, the, in, in terms of ACRs in, in the north. Um, so that period of, of change, I think, will give us a more stable base um, but actually integrating BTP round about a crime system, an HR system, finance system, payroll matters, uh, as well as supplementary uh, system round about intelligence, etc. They, they are not insignificant and I'm not, I'm not in any way uh, seeking to, to minimise them. Uh, and I think it's right and proper that, 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 that members highlight them. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, going back to a, a previous line of questioning to DCC Livingston, can I ask you if you think the way um, the recent events regarding the, the Chief Constable have been played out so publicly, do you think that's been helpful? I, I, I don't think it has um, in terms of the, 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 the public perception and, and confidence in, in, in policing and, and, and in Police Scotland. Um, I wouldn't comment on any, any of the specifics because everybody has got their own rights and, and they've got their own families to, to, to look after and their own, their own privacy rights. What I, what I would say is that I am absolutely clear and, and my own professional judgment is, is that, that there's no crisis in policing. There are issues within Police Scotland, there are issues around governance and accountability and it's right that we're having this discussion here today. There are specific cases that need to be addressed and need to be resolved but, but policing in Scotland is not beleaguered. We've just come through a really, really busy festive period, and I'll use this as specific evidence rather than just assertion. We're not sitting here in the new year with undetected murders. We're not sitting here in the new year 
with critical incidents that went badly wrong. We're not sitting here in the new year with public events and all, and that, that actually led to injuries, officers being injured, breakdown in communications. Uh, we deal with these matters and we deal with them very, very effectively. A response to domestic violence, a response to uh, road, road policing, a response to, to rape and sexual crime. So the service that the men and women are providing on a daily basis, and you, you know that within your, your, your own communities, is extremely high. Every single murder that Police Scotland have had since it came into being has been detected. Now, I, I don't know, because I, I haven't done my comparative work, but I'd be interested to know if there's another jurisdiction that can, can talk over that for that, for that, period, that period of time. Um, what we have in, in, in Scotland is an extremely committed and dedicated uh, workforce of police officers and, and police staff. Police Scotland has undoubtedly had difficulties as, as we've, we've brought the legacy organisations together. But policing is, is I, I think, I genuinely, genuinely think that, that policing is, is, is very strong. And actually, that level of focus at times, the police service, if, if there's a sense of adversity or a sense of, 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 of focus or, or misrepresentation, if anything, the very strong esprit de corps that exists gets even stronger and people continue to focus on doing their duty, <coughs> serving the public, discharging the public duty that, that is, is core to policing. So I do think these issues need discussed and we, we must be clearer in terms of accountability uh, and, and scrutiny and, and public confidence. Mm -hmm. But policing is, is, is strong in this country. We, we should be proud of it. I think, I think you must have read my mind. That was my next question. I was going to ask you to, to reassure the committee and the public that, um, you know, in the front line, it's business as usual, that, you know, policing has not been affected by, by what's been going on, you know, further up the tree. People are working extremely hard because, because that, that's their, their, their job and that's, that's their vocation. Mm -hmm. um, it is disturbing every day. The, the, the level of focus and, 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 and some of the issues do need uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. But these matters will, 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 it's not for the operational police officers and police staff to do that. What they're doing, they're focusing on working very, very closely with, with their communities. And I've said, I've said before that, that in the early days and early years, everything was not, was not ideal. Inevitably, in a very compressed time frame, when you bring such a com complex organisation together, um, it, it, it was probably overly, overly rigid. Um, we, we put greater store on, 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 on consistencies and, 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 and common standards than perhaps looking at the flexibility needed, um, whether that was devolving finance, whether that was allowing for, for, for localism. So we recognise that one, one size doesn't fit all. I mean, that we've, we've been saying it and, and, and we mean it. We're introducing different elements right across the country. Um, whether it's uh, initiatives in, in, in Ayrshire, initi initiatives in the North East, and allowing local police officers to work with, with, with elected members, with communities, with the people who they police, who know what's, what their needs are, uh, to develop the, a policing model that works for them with all the benefits that having that national structure provides. So you've got that capability, that whole access for safety and security uh, that a single service, service provides. So on, uh, on a health analogy, if I'm, if I'm allowed, that if, if your, your, your child is diagnosed with cancer or if uh, your mother is, is, is murdered, these are atypical situations and scenarios, but everybody in the country must have access to the support and capabilities to support that, as well as the general day-to-day -day policing that, that exists. And we can now do that, and we've now got that, that, that capability. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to develop further. We need to ex extend the level of devolvement that, that uh, I'm looking to introduce, and we have been introducing. Um, but, but policing in this country, I think, is strong. Mm -hmm. It's been tested, but it's strong and it's resilient and, and it's committed to, to doing its duty. Well, thank you. That's very reassuring. Thank you. If I could just maybe follow up on that line of questioning, um, both uh, Susan Deakin has mentioned about the complaints and conduct um, issues and, and room for improvement. Uh, do you, uh, DCC, you've just um, talked about some of the advantages of the single floors, being able to respond to things, but in terms of complaints, I know when the legislation was passed, there was some real concern that the previous way when uh, you had the legacy forces, then the way to, to deal with a complaint was, I think, a neighbouring um, uh, a neighbouring um, police force would look at the complaint. So I suppose 
could I have your, your kind of view on how that worked generally and any specific or personal um, experience you might have of how that complaint system worked? Um, uh, and then perhaps I can ask uh, Susan Deacon some other things. In, in, in the, the previous um, structure that we had, I th you're absolutely right, convener. I think, I think it, 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 there was a clear demarcation. If, if it was felt that there was a need either to, to review or to investigate um, a, a set of circumstances in, in, in Glasgow, for example, um, and for public confidence and, 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 and for visibility, you've then got seven other uh, chief constables that you could have that conversation with and ask if they could dedicate resources to, to, to come in and, and, and take that forward. That, that, that still exists. We, we've been asked um, uh, to investigate a, a historical and complex set of circumstances in, in Northern Ireland at the moment. So we have a, a dedicated team that the Chief Constable of the PSNI is, is paying for, but for those very reasons, for public confidence and perception, because it involves uh, some legacy officers in the then RUC, Police Scotland were asked to, to carry out that investigation. So that, that um, distinction is very visible and very clear. With a single service, it's harder to show that, that distinction. And that's clearly where uh, the role of the PERC, I think, is, is critical in terms of that independence um, and, and, and that role and function. We've got a very uh, strong and, and, and open relationship with the PERC, recognising the Commissioner's uh, in, independence. Um, and increasingly, um, I've seen over the, 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 the last number of years, as Police Scotland's evolved, the, the PERC uh, being asked to take, to take more in investigations forward. So the Crown, uh, for example, would direct the PERC maybe to take a number of investigations that previously would have, would have stayed within Police Scotland um, for, for that investigation. So the single, the single service in terms of complaints, it's not as easy, exactly as you suggested, to, to, to give that reassurance around independence. And, and again, that's where I think the role of the PERC is absolutely crucial. If I could perhaps ask um, Susan Dayton about the role of the PERC. Uh, the present investigation with the Chief Constable has now dragged on for seven months. And uh, according to the last financial year, there were 30 new investigations undertaken by PERC. That was a 34% increase in work and 350 um, police incidents. Are you concerned um, about the length of time and um, if perhaps PERC is properly resourced to handle um, these complaints? Well, I don't think it's for me to comment um, on the, the operation and resourcing of the PERC. Um, I think that's for, for the PERC and others, others to do. Um, in relation to the allegations that have been made about the Chief Constable, and as you indicated at the outset, um, I'm not going to comment, obviously, on any of the specifics. That uh, would be entirely inappropriate. Um, but um, I did speak to Kate Frame, um, the Commissioner, yesterday, um, and she has given me an absolute assurance that she will provide a report to the SPA as soon as she can. Um, she's also given me a very clear assurance that um, her office is working hard to investigate what are a number of allegations contained within um, various complaints that have been referred to her and that this has involved interviewing a substantial number of witnesses. Um, she has also stressed that it is entirely appropriate, in fact, it's right and proper, that um, these various statements be ingathered before the Chief Constable is interviewed. And um, the PERC has now asked him to provide dates for um, interview and is working currently to facilitate that with him. So I hope that's maybe helpful if I give just an update on the current situation. Turning to um, wider questions of, of complaints handling more generally. And if I may, I, I would also like to link this to the wider point that Rona Mackay raised a moment ago about the current public debate that's taken place, because these things are connected, obviously. Um, first of all, on, on the wider public debate, um, I completely understand why these are matters of very legitimate public interest and interest to Parliament. I do think it's critically important that all of us who are engaged in, in discussion in these matters 
um, ensure <clears throat> that we don't even inadvertently um, call into question um, the operation of our police service or undermine public trust and confidence in that police service. And I would endorse everything that DCC Livingston said about how the police service is performing in the work of the more than 20,000 men and women that do that job. Um, secondly, I, I, and I'll say this because, maybe it's not for DCC Livingston to say this, the other thing that's been called into question and as part of this debate um, is, is whether um, there is effective leadership in, in this current period, whether there's effective leadership within Police Scotland. Um, and people have even made suggestions about the force being leaderless. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and DCC Livingston and his team um, are working tirelessly um, to maintain and develop the, the police service. And I've had early opportunities to meet with the senior command team in the wider leadership team of Police Scotland, as well as some of the divisional commanders in different parts of the country. And I have been nothing other than impressed and reassured by the leadership that they are undertaking at the present time. And I'd like to put that on record. It is the case, in my opinion, that it's, well, it's my, case, it's my view that it's always important to learn, reflect and improve. I've said that already today. Um, the arrangements that are in place for dealing with um, complaints um, and allegations and conduct issues and so on within uh, the police service are all part of that very new landscape that was put in place by this parliament just, just a few years ago. So I think it is important always to learn and reflect and to think about how it, it, it can be improved in future. I share the view that I've heard the cabinet secretary express in the past that it's particularly important to think about how confidentiality um, is better protected, both for those who complain and those who are complained against. Um, and I've had early discussions, um, collectively actually, with, with Scottish Government officials, HMICS and the PERC, um, about how we might reflect on the experiences um, that we have had so that we can work together um, to continue to improve and develop that, that system in future, not least to take account, as I say, of um, matters of confidentiality. Um, I think, you know, there have been, you know, I think much of what was put in place with, with, within that system um, has been done in a way that genuinely has attempted to ensure that it's, it's transparent, but I think there's a balance to be struck in these kind of processes between transparency and, as I say, protecting the privacy and the confidentiality of any parties that are involved in them. And these discussions, would these be minuted? Would these be a matter of um, that could be brought? And the discussions country? that I've had with colleagues in, in these other organisations, um, no, they're just part of the kind of normal business discussions that I would expect to have both internally within an organisation and with other partners and stakeholders where we explore and we, we consider ways that, that we can work better together and work better in, in the public interest. Um, what I have done is, again, reached out through HMICS to see whether we can, this is another area where we, have, we can bring in additional support. The PERC, in fact, published an audit of the SPA bit of the complaints process just before the new year. So that's another report where there's a series of recommendations and areas for, for improvement. So again, I'm not waiting. Um, to, to continually improve and, and develop. One of, I, I think personally that one of the, the factors around the, the process that we have is that it, it does have a certain amount of complexity in it. And I think that's probably because people, you know, were working hard and cleaning policy makers to put in place a system that's robust. But I think for the public to have trust and confidence, and indeed for the police service to have trust and confidence and a shared understanding of any process, it needs to have a certain clarity um, around it. So, you know, I also think personally that there's scope for us to look at ways that we um, maybe m at very least make, make that process clearer and better understood about where the different roles and responsibilities lie. And if there's ways that we can make it more streamlined and more effective in the future, then we should seek to do that. But in answer to your question, no, I have conversations and discussions with all sorts of people all the time and I, you know, I assure you that where I think it's necessary and appropriate to have 
a formal record of a meeting, I will do that more often than not. The kinds of discussions I'm talking about um, that are what I would call in the improvement space are exploratory, where you're actually trying to think about ways that you can work to, together and develop things going forward. But I stress again, I'm always more than happy to come back to this Parliament and report on what we have actually done as an outcome of those types of discussions. If I could just press you on something that you, you said this morning, you're working in partnership with the Cabinet Secretary, which <coughs> can be viewed as good, and other people. Mm -hmm. But you also have a role, um, an independent role, as the Chair of SP, and to protect the independent deployment um, of, of police officers. Now, you were ready on record and happy to say that you thought the Cabinet Secretary to, was right to ask questions. But the question has been raised also about um, there may be a situation where the, the Cabinet Secretary should be using his special powers. So I, I ask you really just to uh, reflect on that. You, you, you have said that um, right to ask questions, but what's your understanding of when special powers should be used? <laughs> Well, I think as you yourself said earlier on, Convener, that, that often it's much easier to discuss these kind of issues in relation to a specific situation rather than you know, more generically or, or hypothetically. Um, I presume the powers that you're referring to is ministerial power of direction, which exists across a very wide range of areas <clears throat> in the public sector landscape and has very, very rarely, I think, in 18 years of this parliament ever, ever been exercised. So I guess ultimately, that's a power that resides with any minister. Um, as I said earlier, though, um, for my part, um, I take very seriously the responsibilities that are now vested in me as, as chair of an arm's length body of government. Um, but all my experience tells me, including in a former life where, as a minister, I had responsibility for, I think, more than a couple of dozen of public bodies myself, that the best way to keep that arm at arm's length is to have public bodies that are being led effectively and that are functioning effectively. It's when these, these things have to be called into question that ministers need to, to shorten the arm, they need to intervene and they need to ask questions. Um, so I'm working hard to make sure that we have the right relationship with the Scottish Government and I think that is a combination of regular communication but also a clear separation of roles and functions as is appropriate in terms of the statutory functions of the body and, and the terms laid down in a whole raft of other codes and governance frameworks and so on around the operation of public bodies. But I know that the best way that we can do that, the best thing I, it, I can do, is ensure that the SPA is operating effectively so that the ministers and government officials don't have to call into question or, you know, our processes or, or, have, or lack confidence in, in what we do. Supplementary. So following on from that, and given your previous answer saying that if you'd had the sort of request, and that's the Cabinet Secretary's language, that, that, that uh, your predecessor received in November, that you treat that as a, a sign of failure. So, so given that, do you think that, again, if you were to receive such a request, that, that you'd want to make a, a formal record of it? Again, I think... Um, we're in the realms of, of hypotheticals, but I will return to what I said earlier. I think this does answer your question, and I think it is incredibly important. If you have a good, effective decision-making process in place, such as around the matters that were being considered at the meeting of 7th of November, almost by definition, all the process that comes before, during, and after that meeting is well-structured, well-planned, well-organised and well-recorded. It's when you have situations where these things have not been done and done properly that then, by necessity, you don't have that audit trail, if you like, of, of things being done in that way. So, for, for my part, if I were dealing with a comparable situation in the future, um, I would expect there to have been proper communication that you know, as appropriate, could, could be tracked prior to um, the meeting where soundings were taken of a range of different parties and stakeholders that would have a view and an interest in, again, DCC Livingston has talked about the, the Police Scotland dimension of, of this at some length. But again, if, if you are then also then following through in a decision in a way that has proper communication and handling around it, you, 
just they're in a different place, frankly, and all the process around that is better and more sound. So I'm not sure that I entirely follow you. I mean, I quite agree that these matters are important, that they need to be uh, followed through as a matter of procedure. Those procedures need to be recorded. If there's any failure of those procedures and there needs to be some sort of intervention, by very definition of the sensitivity of that and the need for record, that very intervention needs to be recorded, surely. I don't think, I've, to be honest, I really don't think I can add a great deal to what I've, I've said already today. Okay. I really don't. Okay. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Thanks, Commissioner. Just to take you on to the issue of um, finance. I think DCC Lawrence, and you, you pointed to issues around um, uh, around governance that, that need to be addressed. You recognise that, and I think you quite rightly paid tribute to the, the ongoing work day and daily of, of, of officers and staff. But there have now been a succession of, of reports from Audit Scotland pointing to weaknesses in terms of um, financial management. The most recent reports of the Auditor General state our audit identified a number of instances of poor governance and poor use of public money. Uh, this is acceptable before going on, unacceptable before going on to point to the need for greater effectiveness and, and transparency. Would you accept that the financial management within um, uh, and oversight by the, the SPA has at best been haphazard to date? And, and what would you say needs to be done now to put that right going forward? Um, well, there's been a series of um, Section 22 reports from Audit Scotland um, over the last few years that have highlighted a range of different shortcomings in their view around the financial management and financial stewardship um, of the SPA. And to some extent, by extension, given the nature of the relationship, also the, the wider financial management of, of the wider Police Scotland budget, which is in excess of a billion pounds. So this is some considerable matter of public interest. Um, I think it is important to note that an Audit Scotland have also acknowledged this in, in their last um, report to, to, to Parliament just before Christmas, that there have been improvements in financial management and stewardship, and a lot of that has been through strengthening the financial capability or the, the, the financial management capability um, within Police Scotland. Um, and indeed, this was the first year where um, the SPA's accounts weren't qualified. So, you know, it is important, I think, to note the progress has been made, and I hope that's some assurance both to members and, and to the wider public. That, I mean, that's a, certainly a fair point that comes through in terms of the evidence the, sub, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing yeah. has taken as well. But I think where the Auditor General also um, suggests um, a good deal of further work needs to be done if that... Um, reassurance is really to be um, uh, is to deliver uh, the improvements we need to see is, is around detailed strategies yeah. now for, for implementation so I, what kind of assurance can yeah. you give us that um, that those detailed strategies will be forthcoming um, in, in, in the coming months um, I, I'm happy to give an assurance that this is an area of significant attention both of myself and Kenneth Hogg the new interim chief officer and we have also you know, had discussions with Audit Scotland precisely so that we can ensure that we address the issues that they have identified in, in various reports. Um, the Chief Officer of the SPA, of course, is the accountable officer. Um, so there's particular functions that, that fall to him. And I know that one of the things he's, he's looking at is to make sure that he can fulfill these um, functions effectively. Um, the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee is, of course, meeting, the Parliament's committee is, is meeting um, this week, and we'll be looking further at the issues raised in the Section 22 report, which again predate me, um, but they also raise a number, of, I think, of important aspects of how you can improve not just financial stewardship, but again, a lot of this comes back to decision-making. Um, and a lot of the things I've said earlier, but in relation to financial decision making too. So, um, again, I give the assurance that the matters that have been raised in the Section 22 report um, are areas th that's part of the evidence base, if you like, that myself and, and Kenneth Hogg, as the Chief Officer, are, are using to look at the areas where we need to prioritise improvement. And on a more specific point, one of the, um, the issues that drew most public attention and, and I think uh, anger was uh, the payments made out uh, both in terms of, of relocation and also tax uh, liability expenses to the, the outgoing chief executive. Now, the Cabinet Secretary informed Parliament that um, the SPA 
didn't have any discretion on that. It transpired that an element of it, um, the SPA certainly did. Um, I'd welcome your comments on that and particularly welcome um, assurance that steps have been taken. You've talked earlier about uh, early action being taken um, uh, in other areas, but early action taken to ensure that this sort of um, payment, these sorts of incidents are, are, are um, unable to be repeated in future. The particular examples that you give are, of course, the very matters that the Public Audit Committee will be considering this week. And my predecessor as chair and the previous chief executive, as well as two current board members who were involved in these decisions, will be appearing before that committee and um, these matters will, will be explored further. As I say, for my part, um, what I'm interested in is looking to see what, what we can learn from those experiences to do exactly as you suggest, to, to, to try and do everything in our power to ensure that decision making um, around financial matters is, is, is better and stands up to scrutiny more effectively in the future. I have to say that, you know, I give an assurance that we will work very, very hard to, to um, make those improvements. Um, I'm sure we won't get everything right. I've never known of an organisation or a human being that gets everything right. Um, but absolutely. Um, we will work as hard as we possibly can to make sure that, that, that these arrangements um, are as effective as possible and that the SPA itself you know, is, has its processes, procedures and, and capability in place to be able to manage these types of matters effectively. Could I just ask one final question to DCC Livingston? Um, we regularly have representation from the Scottish Police Federation about some of the pressures on frontline policing. Uh, and one of the pressures sometimes comes from more legislation being introduced and changes that have to be coped with. Uh, the most recent one uh, with the new Criminal Justice um, Act coming in and the, the police um, station duty scheme, whereby we we'll now understand that solicitors and bar associations, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, the Borders, Falkirk, and Bartonshire um, have all indicated that they are not going to take part. Glasgow is thinking about it, and that's about a quarter um, of all the, the duty solicitors in Scotland. Could you comment on that and the issue more generally about the impact of legislation and how that affects the day-to-day -day job? The, um, clearly, this change to criminal procedures are the most significant ones we've had probably since 1979, 1980. So, so Section 2 detention, Section 14, as it be became, um, six hours, uh, for, for purposes of investigation, all, all now uh, discarded, as, as uh, colleagues will be aware, following Lord Carloway's uh, review. Um, the build-up to this change has been significant. We've, been, we've had to actually train and retrain a couple of times because of, of, of issues out with our control for the implementation. Um, so the preparation towards uh, Thursday, in, when, when, when the Act uh, comes into effect, ha has been significant. Preparation that the service has done uh, through uh, the, the custody division is to make sure that people are on call and on duty 24-7. There, there's, there's a number of individuals that can be contacted to make sure that if, if an officer or member of staff does have a, a query uh, regarding the implementation of the new legislation and the duties and the interpretation that some experts are there to provide uh, that insight. So we've been working really, really hard towards that. Um, the recent changes were discussed um, with myself and, and, and the Crown Agent, um, the, the, the head of the, the Scottish Legal Aid Board, Chief Executive Colin Lancaster and, and um, uh, Neil Rennick from the Scottish Government um, on the back of uh, a Justice Board meeting that we had last week. It was very dynamic because that scenario that you, you, you outlined was just emerging, so again, for the avoidance of any doubt, it wasn't minuted, it was just quickly, we, we sat around the table, we sat together just after the meeting concluded, um, and it was brought to my attention really quite, how, quite how significant this challenge was going to be from the respective bar associations. Um, my understanding, is, as, I, as I sit here uh, today, is, is that there's, there's still a confidence that the new legislation can be implemented, that if required, uh, the Scottish Legal Aid Board, who have the primary responsibility to, to, to make sure that there's access and there's a sufficient body uh, and stable of, of solicitors available, are, have a number of contingencies involved. And we will also support and facilitate that if, if required. And um, that might even mean moving uh, a particular uh, prisoner 
uh, from one area to another, uh, simply to facilitate that legal advice uh, that they're entitled to, to, to do if the case was of such magnitude that it merited it. Or, uh, again, based on, on risk and based on various other factors, there might be a, a case for liberation. Um, so there's a whole series of contingencies being built round about that, and we don't know until the final hour whether that comes to pass or not. I, I, I'm actually in another uh, role within the justice system. I've been working with the, the review of legal aid that Martin Evans has, be, has been leading. I'm, I'm a member of that uh, review board. So we think we can contribute uh, to, to, to trying to make progress with the legal aid system because access to legal rights is ab absolutely uh, critical. So there is an issue with the new Act. My understanding is that we're, the, the Act is still going to be implemented. We hope so because we've, had, we've been up to the edge a couple of times, as you know, and, and I think we need to, to move forward to the, to the new system of criminal procedure that the Act is there to, to, to maintain. In terms of change, yes, that, that, I, the, 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 the officers and staff of, of Police Scotland have, have been through an enormous amount of organisational change and, and increased scrutiny and focus and, and legislative change. I think we've got a very good relationship with, with the Scottish Police Federation. Speaking for myself, I listen to them. I uh, have enormous respect for the work that they do. Um, they've raised a number of issues with me about, about well-being, about working conditions. I've taken action. Some, you know, we've got three-year strategies, ten-year strategies, but there's some very practical things that we can do to improve working conditions and, and how people feel about their work. So simple things, introducing sat-navs into vehicles, looking at the, the trousers. It sounds a very... A mundane issue, but the quality of trousers that we issue and, and trying to take steps in, in, in that regard. Um, and also, I think the very fact that, that um, we're prepared uh, to listen and we're prepared to try and adjust some, some of our, our, our practices. In terms of our ability to flex to new legislation, um, policing is very, very good at, at, at dealing with unexpected things and responding very, very, very quickly. I think, again, one benefit of the National Service is that we can concentrate resource. We don't need eight policy units. We don't need eight governance units to do some of this, this background work. We do it once, we do it to a high standard, and then we, we, we make sure that all officers and staff uh, get it. So Federation are, are crucial, absolutely crucial, uh, as are uh, the superintendents associations and the trade unions, uh, their involvement is absolutely vital to, to build an organisation to, to make it the one we want it to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. You did mention the movement of prisoners. We won't go into that again because it has been well raised with um, the Federation and I believe will be, continue to be raised. That uh, concludes our questioning. Can I thank you both very much for attending committee today. We uh, now move to agenda num item number seven, which is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing um, on its meeting of 18th of January 2018. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions, and I refer members to paper seven, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide that feedback. Thank you, Convener. As, as you stated, the, the Police Subcommittee met on the 18th of January. There was two items on the agenda. One was the appointment of convener. I'm, I'm grateful for members for electing me. I'm also grateful, very grateful to Mary Fee for her work, and I, and I would like the record to show that. Mary worked in a very consensual way, and, and I, I would hope to carry that forward. The other item was that we discussed in private our work programme, and looking ahead, uh, we hope next Thursday to be covering the issue of um, undercover policing with Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? We also welcome Daniel Johnson to this policing subcommittee to, <laughs> and duly declared his interests. Any other questions on, on that? If not, we now move into private session. Where the next committee meeting will be on the 13th of January 2018 when we'll hold two roundtable evidence sessions, one on...